Hello, everybody. Hi, guys, and thank you for joining me for another webinar as part of the Catology Kitten Care webinar series. This is the third webinar in the series. Super, super excited to have all of you here today. Uh, if you missed the first two webinars, I had uh, two webinars already, one on the subject of caring for bottle baby kittens and one on the subject of caring for growing kittens who are weaning and going through litter training. Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about uh, just general kitten care, please watch the recordings of those webinars. You can access those on my YouTube channel or at kittenlady.org slash webinar. Uh, I also want to sh shout out that I have a webinar coming up next Saturday, and that will be May 9th at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and that webinar is going to be on the subject of feral felines and what to do if you find kittens outdoors, a very interesting topic and something that comes up quite a lot. Um, so that'll be a really cool one, too. Please join me for that on May 9th. Uh, this talk, as well as the whole kitten care webinar series, is being sponsored by Royal Canin. I'm so grateful to them for the work that they're doing with me. Uh, this is streaming on my channel as well as theirs, so I'm very grateful to be able to access such a nice size audience to share all of this information. So thank you to Royal Canin. Uh, if you are registered for this webinar, uh, you will receive a follow-up email. And if you registered for the previous ones, you should have received some follow-up emails that are filled with additional resources and information. If you're watching this live and you didn't register for it, you can just go to kittenlady.org slash webinar, and you can register for this webinar today. Um, and if you do that by the end of the day, your email address will be on there, and I'll be able to send you those additional resources, um, which I usually do a day or two after the webinar. Uh, as always, you can ask questions in the chat wherever you're watching. You might be watching on YouTube or Facebook or wherever it is that you're watching. Uh, you can put some questions in the chat. I will be answering questions at the end. And uh, I just ask that you uh, keep the questions focused on today's topic, which is keeping kittens healthy. So let's begin our webinar. I'm going to introduce myself quickly. Um, if you've watched the other webinars, you already know me, but my name is Hannah Shaw, uh, and I run a project called Kitten Lady. It's a humane education and advocacy project, and uh, my goal is to really help people understand the care and protection of vulnerable young felines. So I work a lot with orphaned kittens and help people understand how to care for them. I have two books. One is called Tiny But Mighty. It's a 300-page resource for foster parents and shelter workers and cat advocates and anybody who's interested in learning more about um, kitten advocacy and care. And then for our young folks or young at heart, uh, you can get Kitten Lady's Big Book of Little Kittens, a very fun picture book uh, that is all about introducing kids to foster care for kittens. I'm also the founder of Orphan Kitten Club. We are a 501c3 nonprofit based in California, but we have programs throughout the United States. Uh, we have grant programs to provide uh, funding for kitten care all over the country. And we also have um, our nursery program, which takes place here in California. And what I love about working with um, our nonprofit is that you know, we get to sort of choose which populations we work with, and obviously we focus on orphan kittens, but not just that. We focus on really the most vulnerable of this population. So we take in kittens who are premature, kittens who are, you know, very, very young newborns. We take in kittens who have um, congenital conditions or medical needs, and we help them go from, you know, being this very vulnerable young baby uh, and help them get healthy and help them uh, become adaptable. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be teaching you a lot of what I've learned through experience in this talk. And uh, I want you to know, I'm not just like teaching you something that I read in a book. I'm teaching you um, from actual experience of things that I'm doing uh, as we speak right before this talk. I was um, giving everybody their uh, morning medications if they needed them, um, you know, scoop and poop, all of that fun stuff. So this is, uh, this is something that I live and breathe. I want to show you some of the kittens that I have in my care right now because I think that they're such great ambassadors for this subject. Uh, this is Chickpea, and Chickpea is a little kitten who um, we just rescued actually 
like an hour after the last webinar. So um, last week after the webinar ended, I got a call about chickpea. She had a bunch of stuff going on. She had a bad upper respiratory infection, eye infection, like really um, a lot of discharge from her eyes and her nose. And she has a congenital condition um, with her mouth. She has a severe overbite um, and that can, can lead to some dental issues later on. So we took her case on and she's just an angel. She's so cute. Um, and then the other very special baby that we have right now, um, if you follow me online, you probably know spinach. Uh, this is spinach and no, she's not just wearing a sock to be fashionable. Uh, she just had a pretty major surgery uh, this past week. And spinach is a very special kitten. Um, she has a couple of different conditions. She has eyelid agenesis, which is, um, you can see her eyes are um, an interesting shape. Um, her eyelids are just not fully formed properly, but her vision is great. Uh, and then also spinach has um, pectus excavatum, which is a congenital condition. And she had to have chest surgery. So check this out. This is um, the other day when we got her back from her surgery and you know she's gonna wear a chest plate for a little while but unbelievable things that you can do with these kittens um, I want you to know that uh, these little vulnerable guys you you can do a lot with them and I love telling individual stories because I think it really shows what you can do so on that note I want to share that actually we set up a kitten cam I hope it's not too distracting during this talk um, that we'll be able to actually check in on both chickpea and spinach and let's see what they're doing so spinach is asleep right now <laughs> but you can see her back there this is live um, so there's spinach asleep she they love to that's actually a little strawberry hut they're supposed to be able to go inside but she likes to crush her strawberries so there's spinach and oh there's chickpea she crushed her strawberry too chickpeas walking around. So um, we'll be able to check in on these guys uh, throughout the talk and I hope it's not too much of a distraction. I think we will go ahead and leave chickpea up since she seems to be a little more active. But uh, you know, I wanted to say, especially in the, in the context of this talk and um, in the context of everything you see me doing with these babies like spinach and chickpea, um, really partnering with a good veterinarian is going to create a dream team for your kittens because um, veterinarians can't do this without foster parents and foster parents absolutely can't do this without veterinarians so um, i want to emphasize throughout this talk and i'm gonna you're gonna hear me say over and over again if you're concerned about a medical condition with your kitten you have to see a vet you have to there's no there's no alternative there. You have to work with a good vet. Um, I'll talk about how to find a good vet, but I want to really emphasize that you know it's a it's a partnership between foster parents and veterinarians. So foster parents are the ones who can monitor the kittens, notice if something's going on with them, advocate for their care, um, and then the veterinarian is the one who can you know assess the kitten and. Um, provide diagnostics, provide a treatment plan, and then of course that kitten comes home with you and you're the one who's actually providing a lot of the follow-up care after the vet. So um, spinach is a perfect example of that and we're going to talk a lot about um, how vets and foster parents work together to make magic happen today. So what is the reason that um, we need to learn so much about uh, health and kittens you know as foster parents we do have to become very knowledgeable about all of this and the reason is that, that we're dealing with a very very fragile population um, you know some of this might sound repetitive if you took the first webinar but i'm just going to repeat a little bit of it um, because it's so important to emphasize that these kittens have very underdeveloped immune systems so uh, they're very susceptible to illness um, especially if they are orphaned very young. Um, you know, kittens rely on their moms for uh, having some of those passive antibodies, but um, a lot of that doesn't happen transplacentally. So um, it's not that they are uh, getting transplacental uh, antibodies from their mom. Most of the um, immune support that they rely on actually comes from breast milk, and it comes from breast milk in the first day of life. Um, there's something called colostrum that uh, kittens drink uh, from their mom during the first day of life, and and uh, that is something that has a lot of protective factors for them. And if they don't 
nurse on their mom during the first day or if they don't nurse on their mom enough, um, they will be a little more at risk. So something to point out if you're getting kittens who are truly newborns. This is why we really want to keep newborns with their moms whenever possible. Um, they're also vulnerable to disease and exposure and injury on our community streets. Uh, kittens are, you know, coming into uh, shelters and rescues typically from an outdoor situation. Somebody finds them outdoors. Um, and so a lot of these kittens are coming in uh, very cold or injured or they've already been exposed to some kind of illness outside in a community cat colony, for instance. Um, congenital issues are also a concern. You know, um, spinach and chickpea both are dealing with congenital issues. That just means something that um, they're born with. And, uh, you know, you might ask, well, why don't we see more of that in adult cats? But a lot of the time, if these kittens don't receive proper care, they never make it to be adult cats. So I'm very passionate about talking about these congenital issues in kittens and showing that actually you can do a lot with them and then they can grow into a, you know, a perfectly happy, healthy adult cat. But um, um, that is something you see quite a bit in these kittens is congenital issues. And then, you know, there's the issue of, um, you know, foster care. A lot of us um, may not be properly trained when we're doing foster care. And so they can, you know, be fragile in that way. If people don't know how to provide the right kind of care for them, then they can be more vulnerable. Or, you know, if there's not um, proper protocol in place to do the preventative care or to do, um, you know, the work that, that these kittens need. So uh, they are a very fragile population, but that doesn't mean that uh, there's not wonderful things we can do for them. So in preparing for this talk, I was really trying to think of like, what is the core message here? And to me, the, the core message here is that there's really three skills involved in keeping kittens healthy. Um, it sounds very simple, but it really is, it really is uh, this simple. The first skill is monitoring, which means you have to monitor how your kittens are doing every single day. Um, you know, it's not just uh, so that you can enjoy watching them grow up, but we actually want to uh, monitor how they're doing so that we can take action if something starts to go wrong. And that's where early intervention comes in. Early intervention means that as soon as you're seeing any kind of red flag in your kitten, you're not waiting for it to get worse. Um, you are, you know, taking steps to help prevent uh, that kitten from, you know, having a domino effect and letting things get worse. Um, and then there's prevention. Prevention, of course, is taking proactive steps to avoid illness. Um, so those are our things like vaccines, dewormers, things that every kitten is going to get regardless of um, how healthy they seem. Uh, we're going to do prevention for um, certain things for our kittens. So these are really the three things that work together to make a healthy kitten. Monitoring uh, how they're doing, intervening, um, which we're going to talk all about all of this, and then providing preventative care so that hopefully we aren't dealing with um, as much illness in these kittens. So what are we monitoring with our kittens? Every single day you're monitoring your kittens, not just when they first come into you, but every single day, you know, you're gonna be interacting with your kittens, you're feeding them, you're scooping their litter, um, you're playing with them, and while you're doing all of this, you're also going to be monitoring them. You're gonna be monitoring their temperament, which is, you know, how they're behaving, how they are acting, um, you know, what does what do they seem like that day? Did something change? You're also gonna be looking at their physical condition. So did something change about the way that they physically um, look or appear to you. Their weight is another really important thing you're going to be monitoring. And then what's coming out of them. And I will warn you ahead of time, we're going to talk a lot about poop in this talk. And if poop talk and poop photos are not for you, you're not going to enjoy a lot of this talk. And so maybe uh, don't eat while you're watching this talk, uh, but it's a really important subject. So I'm going to teach you how to monitor all of these things. So temperament. Temperament is, you know, the kitten's behavior um, and uh, how the kitten is acting at any given time. Normal temperament, of course, is they're going to be active and alert. Um, even a little tiny kitten whose eyes aren't even open yet um, should be able to lift their head. Um, if you pick them up, they should vocalize or wiggle around. Um, you know, you want to see age appropriate movements in your kittens and you're going to get to know your kittens. So every day you're seeing them, um, you're seeing what a normal behavior is for them. And if something starts to shift, don't ignore that. Um, a lot of the time, this is the first indication that something is going wrong. Um, you know, if you walk in the room and you have five kittens and they're very active, they're very playful, and then all of a sudden you walk in the room and you have four active kittens and one who's just kind of like staring at the wall or um, seems 
like really tired for an extended period of time, you know, that's something that you want to make note of. Um, if a kitten is lethargic or unable to make these age appropriate movements, um, if they can't lift their head, certainly that's concerning. Um, if they're kind of like glassy eyed, uh, you know, they're just sort of having a, a change in demeanor all of a sudden. Any kind of sudden change in demeanor um, is, is really a cause for concern. So please notice these changes in temperament and know that if something changes or if you see something concerning, um, that's going to be the time that you're going to talk to your vet, talk to your foster coordinator, um, take some steps uh, to, to help that kitten. Now we're going to talk about physical condition. So you're going to look over your kitten every single day. And, you know, you do this when they first come in. You do this every single day with them. Um, you know, hopefully your kittens are seeing a vet when they first come in. But even after that, every single day, you want to be noticing things like, you know, checking their fur for any wounds or abscesses. I have to say, kittens, you know, they, they're very playful. Uh, they seem fine one day. And then the next day, um, somebody was playing with them too hard, got a claw under their skin, and suddenly they have like a, little abscess on on them um, that can happen you gotta you gotta be handling your kittens and looking at their physical condition to notice stuff like that um, notice if they have any fur loss patchy skin evidence of parasites or something like that um, you know you want to take note of that and deal with it right away before it gets worse you also want to make sure their eyes their nose their ears are uh, free of any residue. They look clean. There's not um, a bunch of uh, discharge coming out of their eyes or nose. Uh, you also want to listen to them. So listen to uh, their chest or airway. You don't have to have a stethoscope to, to do that just as a foster parent. Just take a listen to their breathing. Do you hear something kind of strange and rattly or do you hear um, you know, wheezing uh, in their nose when they're breathing in and out, those are things that you would want to call out. Um, and then uh, observe, of course, uh, that they can make appropriate movements, not just with their temperament, but also physically with their body. Are they limping? Are they favoring one paw? You know, notice stuff like that. Any physical irregularities that arise, um, you wanna take steps to uh, help that kitten right away. Okay, I see that chickpea has disappeared, so maybe Spinach is, oh, they're both sleeping. <laughs> they're both sleeping. Okay, let's talk about temperature. Um, so we're talking about monitoring here, and you don't have to monitor a kitten's temperature every day. I think your kittens are not really going to appreciate if you are, um, you know, giving them a rectal thermometer every single day, um, especially if they're not sick. Uh, so don't take their temperature every day. You do want to take their temperature if um, they're actually sick. Like if they have a fever, then you're going to be taking their temperature. Um, so maybe good to have a thermometer on hand, but um, not something you need for a kitten who's not sick. However, when a kitten is first coming into your care, temperature is definitely a big concern. So right upon intake, um, temperature is something you want to be thinking about because we can basically assume that if a kitten was outside um, or came from an environment that was less than 85 degrees, uh, probably this, this kitten is going to be hypothermic. Um, and that can be a really big problem for little kittens. So we want to make sure our kittens are warm. I say this in every single talk, make sure your kittens are warm. It's so important. Give them a heat source. Uh, you also don't want to warm them up too quickly. So two degrees Fahrenheit per hour is um, a good, uh, you know, upper limit of how much you would want to be warming your kittens. Um, but uh, you want to be providing them with a heat source from zero to four weeks of age at least, and giving them a heat source even after that is still kind. Uh, we talked about this in the first webinar, so if you're interested in learning more about kind of the specific heat sources, you can watch that. But um, here you can see that when kittens are born, they actually have a lower average body temperature, and then over time, the temperature rises, so that is normal. Um, and you know, from about four plus weeks on, you're going to see something around you know 101 degrees for your kittens. Um, you also have your target temperature for environment there. Uh, that really is more applicable if you're using something like an incubator, which most foster parents don't have. Um, if you do have an incubator, I have a great video on YouTube about um, settings for incubators, but don't worry about all that. This is um, more than most people will need. Uh, the heat sources that I list below can all um, be good for uh, helping these little kittens. And the important thing is just that they have access to a warm spot 
and a cool spot uh, because just like we don't want to have our kittens be too cold, you can also have your kittens be overheated and neither of those is a good thing. So um, these little kittens, they, can, um, they cannot thermoregulate internally, but they can externally seek um, cool and warm zones by just physically moving their body. Um, so make sure that you're giving them a heat source and make sure that they have the option to choose if they wanna be near that heat source or far away from that heat source. Uh, why is all of this so important? Well, because if this kitten is cold, if a kitten comes into your care and they are cold, um, Badger here is a great example. This is a kitten I got, um, and he was literally like frozen stiff like a popsicle when I got him. Um, he is not a safe kitten to feed if, um, if he's frozen stiff like a popsicle for a couple reasons. One, if you're cold or hypothermic, um, it decreases your ability to properly suckle. Um, so that formula, rather than going down um, the esophagus and into the stomach, can actually go down the trachea and into the lungs. Um, and that is just gonna drown a kitten. So um, please don't ever feed a cold kitten. The other thing is if a kitten is, um, you know, is properly eating, but they are cold, um, their gut motility can slow, so they don't really properly process the food as well. Um, it can ferment, uh, it, can, it can really cause a lot of problems for the kitten. So um, this is why, you know, anybody who's got a lot of experience with kittens, you'll notice when we take kittens in, uh, feeding is not the first step. Uh, getting them warm is the first step. And we'll talk a little bit about um, order of operations later on, uh, but definitely heat is often going to be your first step with these little guys, just getting them to the right temperature so that they can handle food. Weighing is uh, very important. I talked about it in the first and second webinar, but I'm gonna talk a little more in depth here about what you wanna be looking out for. Um, so again, you're using your kitchen scale, you're weighing in grams because these little guys grow very gradually. So um, you know, you're weighing your kittens um, with a gram scale. You can use um, a bowl or I use actually the refrigerator drawers. That's what, um, that's what dollop is in right there. Um, just make sure that you're properly tearing the scale so you're not weighing anything that's on top of it, you're only weighing the kitten. Um, and then I just want to point out when you're weighing your kittens, if you're weighing them, um, you know, pre and post feeding, that's great. Um, if you're only weighing them once at each feeding, then you just want to be cautious that you're not, you know, uh, weighing them one time before they eat and then another time after they eat, your weights are going to be a little wonky. So, um, you know, maybe make sure that you're just weighing them after they eat, for instance. And then note if the kitten poops because if the kitten poops, that's gonna impact their weight. And you might go, oh my gosh, their weight went down, but actually they just had a big bowel movement. Um, so I sent out my kitten growth and monitoring chart uh, to people who attended the first webinar. If you didn't get that and you want a copy of this chart, please register for this webinar at kittenlady.org slash webinar. Um, if you register for this one today, Keeping Kittens Healthy, then I'll send you a copy of this so you can um, monitor your kitten's uh, growth and weight. Uh, but it's really important to write this stuff down. When do you weigh your kittens? Well, you weigh them at every single feeding if your kitten is a newborn. So these little ones, um, you know, they're very vulnerable. We wanna make sure that they are making all of their marks. So if they're a newborn, if they're a sick kitten who you're monitoring, if they have any concerning symptoms at all, like all of a sudden they start having diarrhea, start weighing your kitten at every feeding. Any newly weaning kittens you're gonna weigh at every feeding, um, just for the first days to make sure that they really are taking to weaning and they're gaining weight and meeting all their marks. And then any new to you kittens. So even if this kitten is weaned and um, seems healthy, if they're new to you, then you don't really know this kitten's health status. You don't really know very much about them. So let's weigh them more frequently um, until you kind of have um, an idea of what is normal for them and you know that this kitten is definitely gaining weight. Uh, you can drop down to weighing them just once a day. If the kitten is like over three to four weeks old, um, asymptomatic, you've had them for a while, um, they're assumed to be in good health. Um, these kittens I might drop down to weighing a little bit less frequently. However, um, if anything comes up with these kittens, you know, if they're five weeks old, six weeks old, um, I've had them for a long time, they seem healthy, but then something starts to go strange, I'm gonna go back to weighing them really frequently. Um, and 
The normal weight gain for a kitten is going to be around 7 to 14 grams per day. Every kitten is different, so um, you know, just the important thing is that their weight is making an upward trajectory. Um, so think about it like this. Babies are growing, just like um, you know, a human baby uh, doesn't stay the same weight forever. We want to see them growing. These babies should never be having a stable weight um, or having a um, dropping weight. That, that doesn't make sense if you're a baby. And if that's happening, it is 100% always, 100% of the time, a sign that something needs to shift, something is going wrong, um, because these babies really do need to be growing every single day. So, um, you know, you want to be seeing a net positive day by day. Um, sometimes they will drop weight um, during a certain feeding, and that's just because um, either they pooped or they didn't have a big appetite in that moment. Um, but the important thing is that for the whole day, they did make, um, they did make good gains. Um, so always weigh your kittens on an empty tank. Uh, you know, if you're helping your kittens go to the bathroom, um, if you're stimulating them to go to the bathroom when they're babies, I recommend doing that before you weigh them and then I recommend just putting a little star um, if the kitten does go potty. So um, this is a fake litter of kittens that I made up. Um, they're named after s'mores. These kittens don't actually exist so don't worry about these kittens um, but I named them Marshmallow, Chocolate, and Graham and I made this just so you can see kind of what a weight chart might look like. Um, and uh, so let's go through these. So Marshmallow is a kitten who's starting out um, first of all, you can notice he's starting out at 350 grams. He's already quite a bit bigger than his siblings. Uh, and every single time he's eating, which this guy is on a four-hour schedule according to this chart, um, every time he's eating, he's gaining, you know, three to four grams. So that's cool. Um, and then right around 4 p.m., he drops some weight. But he's got a star next to it. So you can see that actually that means that he pooped. So I'm not super concerned about him losing weight because he pooped. But I will put a little arrow, a downward arrow. You can write um, just anywhere that they drop so that you can visually notice, oh, this kitten dropped weight like multiple times today, right? Um, so then you can see at his next feeding, he gains weight great. And then at the end of the day, he gained a total of 15 grams. So wow, good job, Marshmallow. We're not worried about that 4 p.m. Um, weight. But let's look at chocolate now. Chocolate is gaining you know, one or two grams each feeding. He drops a little weight around 12, um, but he pooped, so that's normal. Um, but then you know, he's slowly gaining weight throughout the day, but by the end of the day, he only gained six grams. Um, this is not a kitten that I'm thinking is uh, doing really poorly. However, he's not really gaining as much weight as we want to see. So I'm going to, you know, do some extra monitoring of chocolate. Um, you know, maybe try to notice if there's any other strange things I'm seeing going on. Maybe focus more on um, giving him a second chance to eat. Um, you know, maybe feeding him separate from his siblings to make sure that he's, he's doing well. And now Graham, um, Graham gains two grams at the first um, two feedings, but then he drops down without really explanation because um, he didn't go poop there. Um, he, he goes a little bit back up, then he drops um, because he pooped, so that's normal-ish, but he never quite makes up for it, and at the end of the day, he actually nets negative two grams. This is cause for concern. So if you're if you have a kitten who looks like this over the day, they only gained they didn't gain anything and they lost two grams. That's cause for concern. So with Graham, I'm going to be thinking, okay, what's going on here? Does this kitten have diarrhea? We got to address that. That's like really causing problems for him. Um, is he vomiting? Is that why he's losing weight? Is he just not eating at all? Um, if this is a kitten who's with their mom, maybe you didn't even notice that he wasn't um, getting to nurse on her. But this is a kitten who's going to need supplemental feeding um, or you know if it's a bottle baby then maybe this kitten is not actually um, getting a big enough meal so we want to be noticing weight because um, visually you can't necessarily see when a kitten drops two grams in a day but your scale can see what you cannot see so please take this seriously and if you run a foster program you should be giving a scale to every single foster parent um, they cost very little you know you can get a scale for eight dollars um, and it makes such a big difference okay 
So we're gonna move on to talking about um, what comes out of these kittens and we're gonna be monitoring that. So generally they're going to pee at every scheduled feeding if they are a bottle baby who's being stimulated. We talked a lot about that in webinar one. You wanna see clear or light yellow urine and if it's dark, it's typically gonna be an indicator of dehydration. So if you have a kitten who's really dehydrated, you might notice their urine is a bit more concentrated um, and that is gonna be something that we wanna notice, we wanna deal with that uh, dehydration and we'll talk about that a little later on. So on the subject of um, kitten urine and going potty, I want to talk about sibling suckling because this is a big problem for people who are caring for neonatal kittens. Sibling suckling is what happens when you have a litter of kittens and all of the siblings are together and um, I, it seems to mostly happen in cases where the kittens are um, left without mom for a significant amount of time, or if they're in foster care and they're not being fed um, on a regular schedule. However, this can happen in any case. Um, it's just what occurs when kittens are searching for their mom, so they're looking for a nipple, something to suckle on, um, and they end up finding their sibling. And unfortunately, a lot of the time they end up targeting um, the male genitals of their brother, um, and it can be a really big problem. Obviously, we don't want them to be suckling somebody's genitals because they could be consuming, um, you know, whatever waste is coming out. But it's uh, an even bigger problem for the victim. So the one who's being suckled on uh, the victim of suckling can go through, um, you know, pain and inflammation. Um, they can get a bladder infection. They can even have structural damage that can be permanent. Um, so we really want to try to avoid this. And unfortunately, it is habit forming. So once kittens start doing that, um, it becomes a comfort behavior that's a little bit compulsive for them. Um, and it's very hard to get them to stop doing it. Uh, so Let's try to avoid that from happening to begin with. Um, feeding them on a strict schedule is going to kind of satiate that suckling need that they have, but not in every single case. So, um, you know, I do still get sibling sucklers. This is a, a, obviously a very sad <laughs> picture of a kitten who has suckled on her sibling and her face is covered in waste. Not a great photo. Okay, so what do we do with our sibling suckling situations? Um, honestly, my number one advice is separate the suckler out. So whoever is the one who is sucking on the others can be separated for a period of at least several days. Um, sometimes it's gonna take longer. They usually will outgrow it by the time they are weaning, um, although every kitten is definitely different. Uh, but please separate them out. I don't recommend putting clothing and um, restrictive stuff on your on your kittens. I know um, people will try to put like clothes on their kitten, but if you're clothing a kitten um, in a way that is covering their genitals, then you are also potentially having that kitten just be sitting in their own waist. It can be pretty restrictive for them, um, and it's not always a successful thing. So I don't really recommend that. Um, I recommend separating them out. Definitely, definitely recommend against any topical stuff. People will say, oh, put bitter apple on them. Don't do that. We don't want to be exposing our kittens to um, these nasty you know, topicals that some people will try to do. Just separate the kitten out. I know it's a little sad, but it's, be it's the best for everyone. This picture is actually three litter mates um, who had to be separated out because um, the one on the top was suckling on the two on the bottom. Um, but ultimately, they were able to be put back together and they all got to be friends again. Monitor visits are fine. You can have them play together when you're with them. But when you're not there, please separate your sucklers out. All right, let's see um, if we can... Oh, she's got nothing going on. All right, we'll keep it on spinach. These kittens are really sleepy because they ate right before <laughs> the webinar started. Okay, I also want to say if you have a, a victim of suckling, this is one of the victims, um, you want to check their bladder because they can get a bladder infection. If you're concerned that a kitten is not peeing ever for any reason, um, it's a good thing to get acquainted with a kitten um, with what it feels like when a kitten's not peeing. So you can palpate their abdomen. Don't squeeze them super hard, but you can kind of squish around their belly a little bit and get acquainted with what it feels like. If they have a full bladder, um, you're going to feel something in there that feels kind of like a squishy balloon. Um, it's like in their lower abdomen and you're squishing around and then you're like oh there's this like 
squishy balloon that's sort of hard to get a grasp on. Um, if you feel that they have this very, very full bladder and um, you're not seeing them pee, you got to contact a vet at a, uh, as, as soon as possible because um, that could be a sign of a bladder infection. That could be a sign that they're having some kind of serious issue uh, where they're not able to urinate. Um, that was the case in this kitten's case, Sage. Um, this poor guy was the victim of sibling suckling and then got a bladder infection. And um, you know these kittens might need medication. They might need bladder expressions. Please talk to a vet if you see that happening. I should warn you guys, there's a lot of, you know, sad and like kind of gross photos in this. So if you don't want to be looking at butts and poop, um, you know, maybe this is not the talk for you, but I, I think it is very, very important and helpful for foster parents who really are going through these situations. Um, urine and fecal scalding is another kind of potty related health concern that is pretty common in kittens. Um, and that's because, you know, these kittens, they're learning to go to the bathroom. A lot of them have um, diarrhea or like really just unfortunate uh poop and pee situations going on. And in in the case of orphans, foster parents are not always um, the best at keeping them super clean. Mom is usually a little better at keeping her kittens clean because she's licking them all the time. Uh, but please be cautious about urine and fecal scalding. Um, it basically is where uh, fecal residue or urine is left behind. Um, it sits on their tail or on their legs, and that actually can um, burn their skin, scald their skin, uh, and make them have hair loss, irritation, all of that. So um, if that does occur, please um, give them a little bath. We talked about that um, in, I think, the last session. Um, you can apply a light layer of a zinc-free ointment to them, um, but the best thing to do is to avoid that, so try to keep your kittens clean. Um, this is a big, a big issue for our little kittens, so, you know, use a baby wipe after they go potty. Just keep your babies clean. All right, we're moving on to my favorite subject, and um, a lot of people who are involved in kitten care love talking about this. Uh, if you're not involved, you might be like, why do you love talking about poop? But let me just get on my soapbox for a minute here and talk about why kitten poop is so important, probably the most important thing to know about. Um, Poop is a kitten's report card. So just like if you have a child and they go to school and they bring back their report card, um, you wanna see an A plus poop, okay? Uh, if your kid brings home an A plus, you go, all right, good job, little sport. You're doing a great job and I'm not super concerned. We're just gonna keep doing things as we are. However, if you have a kid who brings home a D for diarrhea or a C for constipation, um, you know, if you have a kid bring home a bad report card, you don't just go, oh, that's too bad. You, you take steps to intervene, right? Um, same thing with kittens. If a kitten has um, a bad report card, uh, remember their poop is like a progress report that prints right out of the kitten and tells you, here's how I'm doing. Uh, you got to care about that. You want to look at it and say, oh, that's not, this is not the progress report that I'd like to see. Something's going on here. And then you have to get really curious about that. Um, so uh, looking at poop is something you're going to do if you're fostering kittens. And I encourage you to have a little bit of a sense of humor about it. Uh, my friends and I text each other pictures of poop all the time and kind of go, wow, what's going on here? I have some of those photos in this talk. So if you don't want to see them, I don't know what to tell you. That's what we're talking about, guys. Okay, so this is a kitten with a, a healthy poop. Um, the thing that you want to see with your uh, kittens is that their poop is formed but soft. So it's not like a brick coming out of them, but it has a shape to it. Um, this is a bottle baby kitten, so her poop is mustard yellowy, um, and that is normal for her. In terms of frequency, it honestly really it really shifts depending on the kitten. Sometimes they poop once a day, sometimes they poop twice a day, sometimes they poop 10 times a day. Um, that's probably not what we want to see, but a couple times a day could be normal depending on their age. Um, and sometimes they might skip a day. If they skip a day, just keep an eye on them. Let's make sure that they that they poop tomorrow if they didn't poop today. So that's what's normal. Um, this is probably my greatest achievement in life was the creating the color wheel of poop. Um, and this is in my book, Tiny But Mighty. So um, if you want 
uh, a lot of information about poop. Uh, check out Tiny But Mighty. It's got a lot in there. But uh, this is the color wheel of poop. And I need to emphasize that if you have a kitten with a strange poop, looking at a color wheel is not going to tell you what you need to know. What's going to tell you what you need to know is to go to a veterinarian and get a fecal exam. You have to go get a fecal exam, okay? Um, even for me, if I have a kitten who has weird poop, I go and get a fecal exam. So this is not um, this is not in any way to diagnose your kitten, but this is to give you kind of a guideline, some parameters of what you might expect if you see some of these colors and textures. So um, this is normal. Uh, brown poop is normal for a weaned kitten, and a mustard yellow poop is normal for a nursing kitten or a um, bottle baby kitten who is drinking formula. So that's normal. As long as you see a poop that is formed, it's got good shape to it, and it's those colors, then, you know, that's that's a uh, not cause for concern. You can text those photos to your friends and uh, say, yay, let's celebrate, and then see which of your friends actually uh, text you back ever again. <laughs> That's how you know who your real friends are. Um, okay, all of these, not normal. If you see not normal, you have to do something about it. Um, it's not normal for a kitten to have, um, you know, really like dark blackish or red or beige or green. So let's go through what some of these might actually be indicating. And again, every kitten's different. You can't know, nobody can know um, without a fecal exam what's going on. The fecal exam basically looks like at a microscopic level at what's in the stool and tells you really what's going on. Um, but here's some of what you might expect. Um, brown, you know, solid stool, that's, you know, well-formed. That's going to be our goal here. So good for you if that's what your kitten has. If it's really loose or smelly, um, then get a fecal exam. The mustard yellow, that's normal if they are, uh, you know, a kitten who is uh, nursing or bottle feeding. And once it's um, once they're in transition, like during the early days of weaning, you're going to see this like really interesting marbled poop where um, it's like yellow and brown marbled together. So don't panic about that. That's just, um, you know, they're they're uh, switching to a new food. Green stool. That's not normal. If you see a stool that is green, it might indicate that they have a bacterial infection. A lot of these kittens have bacterial imbalances in their stool. So talk to a veterinarian, have them look at the poop, you bring them a poop sample, um, and they might end up prescribing um, something like an antibiotic for the kitten, but of course, it depends on your vet and your kitten. Um, it can also be a sign of Giardia, which is a uh, nasty protozoal uh, parasite that some kittens might have. So uh, talk to your vet if you see any of this weird green stool. Beige stool. Beige poop is usually or often um, a sign of some kind of nutritional or GI issue. So a lot of the time these are kittens who are um, weaning, who are not doing a good job of absorbing the new nutrients, or maybe they've been prematurely weaned. Their body's just not tolerating it. And the poop is beige because it's actually like... Um, it's undigested food, so their food is kind of passing right through them without them absorbing it very well. Uh, we really want to be cautious if we see beige poop or like this kind of strange curdled looking poop. Uh, let's make sure that they're eating the right thing for their age. So if I see that in a, in somebody's, if somebody sends me that picture, I go, "What? How old is your kitten? And what are they eating? And let's make sure their food is, um, you know, not expired. Let's make sure that they're eating a good kitten diet. Let's make sure that." They're not, you know, a three-week-old who you're trying to put on wet food, for instance. We want to wean our kittens on an appropriate schedule. Um, overfeeding could also cause that issue. Other things as well. Um, but, you know, if you see something that you think might be nutritional in nature, scale the kitten back to their liquid formula or, um, you know, obviously talk to a vet about these issues. There are things you can do like um, probiotics and pre-digestive enzymes. Um, you need to talk to a vet about which ones are appropriate. You're not like just using something you get for humans. Um, so there are veterinary products um, that are probiotic or pre-digestive that can help some of these kittens. Um, if you see black stool, that's usually going to be um, a sign of uh, bleeding in the upper GI tract. Um, it, it might look really tarry. Uh, definitely um, talk to 
a veterinarian if you see black stool. But I do want to call out, um, if the kitten is a newborn, like they are brand new, they have an umbilical cord and their umbilical cord is wet and you think they were born like today or yesterday, um, then you might see a dark stool that comes out of them that's actually normal. That stool is called meconium and it comes out... Um, it's the first poop that they ever have, and it is like really tarry and dark black, and that's because um, that's actually the digested food that they were consuming when they were still inside their mom. So it's like um, it's placental food. Um, once they uh, have that poop and then they're eating or nursing, um, they're going to have a normal looking poop hopefully after that. And then red, um, if you see red, definitely that's a sign um, probably of bleeding. Uh, this kitten might be having lower GI tract issues, um, inflammation, colitis. Um, you know, in this case, we want to talk to a vet also. Um, they may give them something that's uh, got some anti-inflammatory properties or something, some kind of medication to deal with whatever is causing that bleeding. But all of these things are not normal. Um, please talk to a vet, get a fecal exam. Um, and then there's all these lovely textures you can have with poop. So um, anything super mucusy, mm -mm -mm, that's not normal. You shouldn't see like strands of mucus in your kitten's poop, okay? So that probably could be some kind of parasite. If it's slimy, oily, you know, you want to make sure your kitten is fully dewormed and not just um, dewormed for like roundworms, but that they're actually dewormed for all of the various parasites um, that they might have. A fecal exam is going to tell you what they have. So then if you get that fecal exam, they can say, oh, this kitten has coccidia. And then you go, okay, what medication do I use for coccidia? And they, they prescribe that to you. Um, so definitely if they have mucusy poop, get a fecal, give them the medication that they need. Curdled poop. Again, this is, this is a lot of time going to be nutritional in nature. Make sure that their food's not expired. Make sure that, um, you know, that they are uh, being supported properly with a, a good diet. Um, go to a vet if you're concerned. Liquid stool is a big no-no. That's not like something that you're going to figure out next week. That's something you're going to figure out today. Like if you see liquid stool coming out of your kitten, you're going to stop what you're doing right then and go, okay, I got to go to a vet like today um, because that can uh, accompany some pretty serious things. Um, that could accompany panleukopenia, which is a gnarly virus we'll talk about a little later on. Um, it is also purging uh, hydration fluid from their body if they have uh, liquid stool. So please take that very seriously. Um, you want to make sure that you're also addressing um, dehydration in kittens who have liquid stool, but that's a, that's a big problem right away. You need to deal with that. Soft stool. Um, if you see stool, that's like, you know, it's kind of, I call them like their little mud butts, you know, or if they have like kind of, um, stool that looks like soft serve or something like that. Um, we want to make sure that this kitten is, um, you know, getting a fecal, that they have been dewormed, that they have all the things they need, um, you know, but this might be sometimes what it looks like on the way to um, getting good or on the way to getting bad. Um, hard stool, really, really firm stool can be a problem for them too. Um, if they have chronic constipation, you got to talk to a veterinarian about that. Um, if they're having a hard time pushing their stool out, uh, you know, this is something that we need to address. Definitely. There's a lot of reasons that that can happen. Form stool, a nice form stool. We like that. Now I'm going to show you like super gross pictures now. So put down your food if you're eating. Look away if you don't want to see gross kitten poop. These are photos, real photos, um, that are photos that I found from my texts with uh, my kitten foster friends. And I went through and found the most interesting looking ones that I could share. And I just want to show you some of the nasty things that you might see and talk about what you might be thinking uh, when you see them. Okay, fair warning. And now let's see if we have any cuteness to show. No. All right, we're going to look at some poop photos. You ready? Here we go. Okay, yikes, 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 yikes. Okay, this poop on the left, it looks very red, right? Um, that is a definite no-no. If you see poop that looks kind of red, um, you should you should know that that, that doesn't look right. Um, this kitten in particular uh, ended up being prescribed by a veterinarian, something that um, is an antibiotic that has also some anti-inflammatory properties and some anti-parasitic properties, and that kitten ended up 
doing just fine. But of course, they had to get um, a prescription from a veterinarian. So don't let this continue if you see that. Now, this second photo, um, the very beige looking poop with some chunks in it, that to me is that that kind of um, like weaning issue stuff that we were talking about. It also looks a little slimy. So remember, you could have a lot of different things going on. You could have a kitten who, um, you know, is, is both going through weaning, having digestive issues, and uh, has, you know, some kind of protozoal parasite or um, something icky going on in there. This kitten definitely needs a fecal exam, um, and we want to be cautious about making sure that they're eating something that's appropriate for them and getting um, any medication they might need. The third picture um, is actually uh, something that I noticed on a kitten a couple weeks ago. I had a kitten who um, I noticed had some stool on his backside, and uh, he actually ended up having um, constipation, and this was kind of stool that was coming out um, uh, around a very hard stool. Um, notice stuff like this. If your kitten has like uh, you know stool sticking to them, that's not normal. Um, thank goodness I noticed that because I was able to then notice things that were going on internally with him. And then the fourth picture, um, I just want to call out that uh, this photo actually is not an unhealthy poop. This is meconium. So this is a newborn kitten, and that bottom part of the poop is uh, the the placental, uh, you know, ingested and digested food that I talked about. So if you get a true newborn who was just born and you see that, that's not cause for concern. You can see that um, as they uh, were born and they started eating um, with their mom, then they started having a more normal looking poop. Okay, sorry guys, I know that that's a lot to look at, but you gotta care about this stuff. Okay, let's move on to something a little cuter. Um, I mean, this is still a poop picture, but at least it's a happy poop picture. This is like your A-plus poop. And when you get your A-plus poop after going through all that nastiness, you're going to go, yay, and you're going to celebrate and put a little party hat on your kitten and tell your foster coordinator how proud you are and thank your veterinarian for helping you. Um, this is a good-looking poop. All right. We got through all the poop photos, you guys. So let's talk about um, diarrhea, though. Um, if you have a kitten who has diarrhea, that is common, but not normal. Does that make sense? You're gonna see it a lot in kittens, but that doesn't mean it's okay. Common doesn't mean normal. Um, so it's common for kittens to have diarrhea, but it's our job to get curious about that and to try to address it. So what are the first kind of steps to, to be thinking about with diarrhea? If your kitten has diarrhea, a lot of the time it's going to be um, some kind of parasitic issue. So these parasites that, you know... Um, are in inside of your kittens that give them um, a lot of uh, issues like diarrhea. So please make sure that your kittens are actually dewormed. Um, make sure that if you're part of a foster program that you are actually going in and making sure that they get uh, you know any additional rounds of deworming they need. Um, and you know, remember that there are parasites that are not treated by uh, every single dewormer. So um, not all dewormers are the same. Uh, make sure that your foster program is actually doing a fecal exam and treating for the specific parasite that your kitten has. Um, might there be a bacterial imbalance? This is um, kind of my second line of thinking when my kittens have diarrhea. First is, are they fully dewormed? Second is, is there something bacterial going on here? Talk to a veterinarian. Um, you know, they might put them on an antibiotic. If they do put them on an antibiotic, they might also balance that with a probiotic. This is all veterinary stuff that you have to get from your vet. Um, did they have issues while weaning? If so, you want to step them back to a formula. Um, maybe consider asking a vet about a predigestive enzyme. And then um, number four is definitely uh, if there are other symptoms, if there's liquid diarrhea, if, but then they're also vomiting or they're also really lethargic, isolate that kitten right away. Don't let that kitten be around, you know, a lot of other animals. Isolate them, get them tested for panleukopenia. That can be a sign of a, a serious virus. So um, this is kind of my four, four steps of um, trying to figure out what's going on with my diarrhea babies.
Okay, now we can talk about the opposite end of that, which is constipation. This is Jimmy, who um, is the one whose backside you just saw. Um, and he was a kitten who just went through a lot of constipation. That can be caused by dietary issues, like changing a diet too quickly, or um, you know, it, it can be caused by any kind of dietary problem. Um, dehydration, because um, they don't have like the proper uh, fluid to pull into the stool to help it pass easily. Um, blockages can be an issue if the kitten uh, chews on a feather toy and consumes it, that could cause a blockage. Um, and then there are even congenital conditions that can cause this. So, um, you know, I've had kittens who were born with a butt that was uh, 10 times too small for them. And uh, that's something that, you know, you have to see a veterinarian and they actually can surgically help that kitten. If they don't poop for 24 hours, don't panic. This is um, probably a really big question and comment that I get online. My kitten didn't poop and it's been 24 hours. Should I go to an emergency hospital? And my response to that would be 24 hours, I wouldn't go to an emergency hospital. 24 hours is when I would start going, okay, I'm gonna monitor this kitten a little more closely going to pay attention to their temperament. I'm going to palpate their abdomen. I'm going to help them um, try to get some poop going. So um, you can give them a nice little warm bath with their tummy um, submerged and uh, you can try stimulating them. Um, you know, you can bicycle their legs and try to get some, uh, some movement going. Um, but you know, really it would be the more 48 hour mark that I would say, yeah, you got to go to a veterinarian with that kitten. Cause that's definitely not normal cause for concern. Um, if they are um, going to a veterinarian and they have severe constipation or obstipation where it's actually stuck inside of them, um, then some of the things you might expect at the vet could be something like an enema, which the vet will perform, um, or deobstipation in really serious cases, which is where they actually go in and manually have to remove um, any stool that's backed up. Um, but let's try to avoid all of this. Let's keep our babies hydrated. Let's, um, you know, be mindful of their nutrition. Um, you know, we want to do our best to try to avoid rather than have to go through some of these things. Um, and whether the kitten has diarrhea or uh, constipation, we always want to be thinking about their hydration. Hydration is so important in these little guys and, um, you know, they can become dehydrated really, really easily. Um, they have a higher need for water than their adult counterparts. So, um, they have higher body water content and, um, it's especially risky for them, uh, to become dehydrated because, you know, their bodies are so small, they need a lot more hydration. Um, and then they go through all of these various things that really purge water from their bodies. So diarrhea is purging liquid from their bodies, vomiting, um, hyperthermia if they're too hot, um, and then just failing to consume sufficient fluids to begin with. You know, if you have a kitten who is weaning and they haven't figured out water yet, or if you have a kitten who, um, has gone a long time without, uh, you know, having their mom's milk, um, that could be a cause for dehydration. If a kitten is dehydrated, there's a couple signs that you might notice. We talked about the dark urine already, um, but pale or dry mucous membranes. Um, mucous membranes, of course, would be uh, things like their gums. Um, if they look pale or dry, that could be a, a bad sign. Um, and then you might notice... Um, that some people recommend a Turger test. That's like the test where you take the back of the uh, the back of the neck. So um, I'm sure you can do this on your hand at home. You know, you, you uh, create a little tent with the back of the neck, and then you drop it down to see um, how quickly it snaps back. Um, that is something that's done a lot in adult animals, um, and it's something that you can do in kittens, but I want to caution you that um, it really only works for kittens four weeks plus, and that's because um, kittens who are younger than that have a lot of loose skin. Um, it's likely that the skin is going to um, kind of tent upward, uh, whether they're dehydrated or not. Um, but if, the, if you have a four week plus kitten and you tent the back of their skin and it kind of stays um, upright uh, for a, an extended period, that's also a sign of dehydration. But honestly, you can basically assume that if a kitten is vomiting or has diarrhea, they are going to be dehydrated. We want to deal with that. Okay, so how do we deal with dehydration? 
there's really three kinds of dehydration. There's mild, moderate, and severe. And I want to emphasize that you have to respond differently depending on how severe their dehydration is. Um, for mild dehydration, these are going to be your kittens who have um, you know, they have some diarrhea, uh, maybe they have gone a little too long without eating when you first get them in. We just want to be, um, you know, giving these guys more oral hydration support, meaning like through their mouth. Um, so what I do with, with my little um, kittens who have diarrhea, any kitten who has diarrhea, any kitten who's new to my care who I think might be dehydrated, I, instead of mixing their powder formula with water, I mix it with Pedialyte um, or any kind of electrolyte replacer. Um, so you don't need to um, know some fancy recipe here. It's literally just follow the instructions on your powder formula. Um, but instead of using water, use Pedialyte. Um, and that's something that you can do uh, with these little kittens who um, are bottle babies who have some mild dehydration. For weaned kittens, you can add some water um, in with their wet food and mix it in so that they just get a little bit extra uh, extra water water. Um, then moderate dehydration. These are our kittens who are like pretty, they're pretty dehydrated. Um, we can try to give them some oral fluids like we talked about above. Um, but then there's also something you may have seen called subcutaneous fluids. That's um, what's in the background here. This is baby Splash and he was a um, moderately dehydrated kitten that I was caring for. Um, subcutaneous fluids are something that a veterinarian can teach you how to do. This is something you can learn to do at home, but you do it under the supervision of a vet, meaning they are the one who's actually providing you with the um, bag of fluids. They're the one who's teaching you how to do it. You do need to learn how to do this hands-on because um, obviously anytime you're poking a kitten with a needle, that is a uh, Something that could go very wrong if you don't know what you're doing. So, um, but you know, this is a skill you can learn. This is why it's great to partner with a good vet. Um, talk to your vet and ask them um, to teach you this skill, so that if you have these moderately dehydrated kittens, um, they can help you uh, make sure that you're able to give them that hydration. Now, for severe dehydration, and this is something a lot of people don't know, and honestly, I had to learn this the hard way, and it's it's devastating. But when you see a kitten who is severely dehydrated. Um, you'll notice things like their eyes are going to be kind of shrinking into their head. You can see um, like inside their eyelid perhaps. Um, they are very, very dehydrated. These kittens are not going to be able to um, receive their fluids orally or subcutaneously. You, you know, you're, you're uh, fighting an uphill battle here and you're not gonna win if you're trying to give these kittens um, just oral or subcutaneous fluids. If a baby is that severely dehydrated, they need to go immediately to an emergency vet. Um, IV fluids, which are gonna be done only by the veterinary team, um, that's that's gonna be the life-saving option in those extreme cases. So, um, you know, in most cases, in, in the majority of cases you're gonna be dealing with as a foster parent, the oral, oral rehydration, just giving them, um, you know, Pedialyte or an electrolyte formula orally um, is going to be a, a good bet for you. Okay, we also talked about the importance of deworming, so I just wanted to call out um, kind of how that might look. Every program is going to be different, but most shelter and rescue programs will start deworming their kittens around two weeks of age and then repeating that every two weeks. Um, it does vary by program, so I can't tell you what to do. Um, you got to talk to the foster program that you're working with, um, but that's, that's about typical. That's what Orphan Kitten Club does. Um, it definitely varies by organization, not just in the schedule, but also in what they are treating for. So some organizations are going to have a really well-rounded uh, deworming protocol where they're treating for all of these different things, roundworm, hookworm, um, coccidia, giardia, tapeworm. Um, some programs are only treating for uh, roundworms and hookworms. And then um, if the kitten has these other issues, then they will um, step in and treat for that. Um, so just be aware of what your foster program offers. Um, and you know, it's, it's uh, a thing that, you know, I want to empower foster parents to be uh, educated about. Cause I would say that um, the, the 
a very common question that I get from foster parents is, my kitten has diarrhea, I don't know what to do. And then the first thing I ask them is, have they been dewormed and what were they dewormed with? And a lot of the time foster parents say, I don't know, um, I'm not sure what my organization does. So find out what your organization does so that you know, you're know you educated about that and um, you, know, you can uh, ask a vet or ask your foster coordinator to help with anything additional that they need. Um, and again, fecal exams, fecal exams, fecal exams from a vet, from a vet, from a vet. I keep emphasizing this, it's so important. Um, oh, it looks like spinach might be waking up a little bit. Let's see what she's doing for a second. Spinach, are you waking up? No, nope, just kidding. She just moved her head a little bit. Oh my gosh, these guys are not giving you much, are they? Maybe uh, maybe Andrew will go over there and say hi to them um, before the end of the talk so we can actually get to see them walk around. But honestly, that's kittens for you. Um, okay. Let's talk about how to pull up the correct dose of a medication. So um, with all of these things that we're talking about, I'm saying, you know, you're going to go to the vet and they might give you a medication. Um, you are never dosing medication. Your vet is dosing your medication. However, they're going to write down a dose. They're going to say, oh, give 0.03 milliliters twice a day. You need to know how to actually pull that up. What does that look like? Um, and if it sounds silly to say that you need to learn what how that works, um, I see a lot of people do this incorrectly, and it was confusing to me when I was a new foster parent. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to correctly pull up the right dose of a medication. Dosing is done by weight, and your veterinarian is going to give you the dosing information for the kitten. You don't have to worry about dosing because that's the job of the veterinarian. They're going to tell you the dose. Your job is simply to correctly interpret the dose. So let's talk about how to do that. This is a one cc syringe, and that's usually what you're going to be using for giving oral medication to a kitten. But there's a lot of different numbers on here, and it's very easy if you are new to giving medications to get it wrong. So with my one cc syringe, I'm gonna draw up one milliliter. So here's what it looks like if you pull up 1.0 milliliters of medication. Now let's do 0.1. So here we have 0.1 milliliters of medication. You can see that 0.1 is one tenth as much as 1.0. But with little kittens, depending on the medication, you might even be given a dose as small as 0.01. There's little teeny tiny lines on here and each of those is 0.01 cc's. So I'm gonna pull up just 0.01 now. So there's 0.01. And you can see this is just a little whisper of medication. And it's really important that if you've been dosed 0.01 for a drug, that you don't accidentally do 0.1 or 1.0. There's magnitudes of difference here that can be very harmful to a kitten if you don't pull up the correct amount. Okay. So let's talk about kittens and their healthy or sometimes not so healthy guts. Oh, look at that. Andrew's playing with spinach. What a guy. Oh my gosh. He put, a, that's funny. Andrew's funny. This is um, <laughs> my fiance, Andrew, and he's helping us all get a nice little look at spinach there. Um, you can see she has her little chest plate underneath her uh, sock. Um, she's wearing an Argyle sock. Um, please don't put clothing on your kittens but she needs it uh, for protection. She just had her surgery. So thanks, Andrew. So sweet. What a guy. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's move on, but we'll keep spinach up there so that we can really... Um uh, get a chance to see her and now we're all gonna be distracted by the baby and I'm gonna be distracted. Ah, <sighs> kittens are cute, you guys. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, kitten GI tracts. Um, they are born with a sterile GI system um, and they develop their intestinal flora over um, the first days of life by interacting with their mom. So they're nursing on mom. Um, they are you know, developing all of the good bacteria in their gut through that. So when they're in foster care, um, sometimes they can actually not have good bacteria in their gut. Um, you know, A lot of these kittens have imbalanced gut bacteria. So a veterinary probiotic is really something um, that I 
just want to say is an option for your kittens, and uh, it is something that you should talk to a veterinarian about. Um, Benabac Plus is the one that I use, and it's down in the um, bottom right corner there. But uh, you know what? You should talk to a veterinarian and find out the best one that works for you. B12 is another thing that can be really good for kittens with um, GI issues. Uh, the B12 we use is injectable, so you need to know how to do that, um, and you have to get it from a vet. Um, but talk to a vet about these things. Um, these might be ways that you can support um, a kitten's guts. Uh, let's talk now about kind of um, dealing with emaciation. Kittens who are um, coming into you who are really underweight, really thin. Um, this is a kitten, Baby Ray, who uh, came to me and he was bone thin, couldn't eat. Um, with these kittens, we don't want to give them a full strength meal because he's like starved. Um, so we got to slowly reacclimate him to eating. You can dilute your formula. Um, you know, typically formula is a two to one ratio. Um, so we can um, start it at four to one uh, with that's four parts of your Pedialyte um, or water and one part of the um, powdered formula. Of course, it depends on what formula you're using, so read the instructions, but you can dilute it um, and then work your way up slowly to a full strength meal. Um, you never want to give them a full uh, strength meal and you never want to give a full tummy meal to an emaciated kitten. So smaller quantities but higher frequencies is good for these little ones. Let's get them up to speed. Um, if they won't eat, uh, the first thing that I would ask someone is, um, you know, are they responsive and are they able to swallow? If they can't swallow or they're not responsive, you shouldn't be trying to put food in their mouth. You need to go seek medical attention right away. Um, the second thing is, are they a proper temperature? If they're not, stabilize them first and then try. So get them warm first. Um, are they being offered an age appropriate diet? Uh, Sometimes people say the kitten won't eat, you know, um, the kitten in this picture, baby Ray, if you were trying to give him, um, you know, wet food, he's too young for wet food. So, oh my gosh, he won't eat. Well, because you're trying to feed him the wrong thing. So scale back, let's give him formula. Um, does he understand the method of eating? Maybe he doesn't understand how to eat out of a bowl, but he understands how to eat out of a syringe or out of your hand. Um, so these are like my main questions I would ask for a kitten who's not able to eat. Um, but what do you do if they won't eat? First, Give them like a food buffet. I went through food buffet stuff in the last talk. Um, and if you're interested in that, you should definitely go watch the Beyond the Bottle talk because um, I talk all about different things you can give a kitten as part of their um, food buffet to see what works. Try wet food, dry food, formula, mixing things together. Um, you also want to try changing the method of eating. So if you're feeding in a deep bowl, you can try a flat plate, try hand feeding, um, try switching back to the bottle or um, syringe. Um, I want to say I know a lot of people recommend um, the baby food for kittens who are having a hard time eating. And that is definitely an option. It's something that we do occasionally, but I want to really emphasize it is not a complete diet for a kitten. So you shouldn't do that for more than one or two meals. That's sort of an emergency um, food that you can use to prompt them to eat. Um, so, you know, you can try uh, giving them some of that uh, like chicken baby food. Just make sure there's no onion or garlic in it. Um, but please only do that for one meal, two meals maximum, because we do need them to have a complete diet of kitten food. And then if you're bottle feeding them, if you're bottle feeding a kitten who cannot eat, they're having some kind of problem where they're not latching, um, please be very, very slow. You can syringe feed a kitten, but it's very, I'm gonna show you a video of baby Ray being syringe fed. Um, before I do that, I wanna just mention worst case scenario, tube feeding is something you can learn to do. Um, don't let anyone tell you you can't tube feed a little kitten because it's something that you can do if you're trained to do it. However, you can't be trained to do that in a webinar. You can't be trained to do that on FaceTime. You have to be trained in person. Um, you can absolutely cause um, fatal problems in a kitten if you are uh, tube feeding without hands-on training. So get trained if this is something you're interested in from an experienced caregiver or a veterinarian um, or a vet tech. They can teach you how to do that, what tools you need and how to do it safely. Um, but that is uh, something that 
I want to call out for people who are interested in kind of taking their fostering of these vulnerable neonates to the next level. Tube feeding sometimes is the life-saving option um, for a little kitten who truly cannot eat. Um, if you can't tube feed, I'm going to show you this video. This video really upsets me. Um, I think I almost didn't include it because I think it's an upsetting video to watch, but um, it's a little less upsetting because this kitten does fine, and I'll, I'll show you that he, he grew into a healthy, happy boy. I did end up including this because um, I want you to see what it looks like if you don't have access to tube feeding and you have to get some kind of nutrition in this kitten. Um, I want you to see how to syringe feed them safely. It's literally one drop at a time. Um, we are not gonna flood our kittens um, with formula. So let's let's see. This is baby Ray um, when I first got him in. So kind of sad. He's not doing so hot. But check out how I'm feeding him. I'm putting one one drop on his tongue and then he's swallowing it and I'm observing and making sure he's swallowing it. He is actually swallowing. It's just one drop at a time. You got to eat. You gotta eat. Oh no, you don't like to eat. But you gotta eat. Okay. So this is baby Ray, um, all grown up and looking healthy. Um, and I, that video is, it breaks my heart to see him like that, but I wanted to share it so that you can see, you know, you can, in a pinch, as long as they are swallowing, um, get them through that day, get them through that moment, get them through until they can get to a vet to be tube fed. Um, you know, the, we, we have to get something in these little guys. Um, so that was what Ray's, you know, early day, day or two looked like with me. Um, I think I ended up switching to tube feeding for him, but he did great, grew into a beautiful cat. There he is. Um, what if a kitten aspirates? Now, aspiration is where um, a kitten, you know, does not swallow properly and it goes down um, the wrong pipe. Um, and this can be really, really dangerous or deadly for kittens. So if you think that a kitten has aspirated, um, please coupage immediately. Coupage is, oh my gosh, she's trying to look at the camera. I knew this was going to be distracting. <laughs> coupage is basically tapping on um, the ribs on the side of the kitten. Um, and that is something that, you know, you're not like hitting them really hard, but you're not like gently touching them. You're really, you know, tapping with a little bit of force to try to get anything that is, um, anything that's down there, you know, we want to tap it and get it out. Um, so with aspiration, if they think they just aspirated, help them sneeze it out. Um, you know, you might see something come out of their nose and they go, pfft, pfft, you know, help them sneeze it out. Sometimes I'll um, put them at an angle like this kitten in this picture and just be like, okay, baby, let's try to get as much of that out as possible. Dab their nose with a tissue. Um, and then after that, you really just wanna monitor, um, monitor them, make sure that um, their breathing is okay. If you start to hear any rattling or wheezing or anything that sounds not right, talk to a vet. If their temperament changes, talk to a vet. If their weight changes, talk to a vet. Um, you know, any signs of illness, take them to a veterinarian. Um, you know, you don't have to panic if you think that this happened um, right away. You just monitor. And then if you see that something is going wrong, please go to a vet right away. They may put them in on, on an antibiotic, um, which can help kittens who have had a, a bit of aspiration. Okay, here is Chickpea. Let's switch to Chickpea Cam. Um, she's still just sleeping. Oh, Chickpea. Well, we'll leave her on there. Um, so Chickpea, uh, when she came in, you can see she had a bunch of discharge on her eyes and her nose. Um, she had an upper respiratory infection. So that is typically viral in nature or often viral in nature. Um, and it can be accompanied by a secondary bacterial infection. So if you see like green, yellow mucus, that's usually going to be uh, bacterial in nature. Um, and those are the cases where you definitely got to talk to a veterinarian. Um, if you see kind of that mucus or crust forming around their nose or eyes, um, you know, this is not like um, 
you get the cold and then you get a cold and then you just drink orange juice and you're fine. In kittens, this is, can be a bit more serious because um, if they can't breathe through their nose, then they can't eat. Um, and you know, if you leave their eyes crusted, they can they can end up with you know damaged damaged eyes. So let's uh, deal with these upper respiratory infections right away. Keep their nasal passage and their eyes clean by wiping away mucus with a warm wet cloth. You can um, get a washcloth or a cotton ball. Just put some nice warm water. Break up all that mucus and wash it away. Um, nasal drops or a nebulizer might be necessary. I'm going to show you a video of a nebulizer. Um, and then monitor for any other symptoms like weight loss. If you see any of these concerning things um, popping up, definitely um, you know address each symptom as it arises. But upper respiratory infections, these kittens are gonna need a veterinarian to help assess what's going on and how to treat it. Uh, let's talk about how to safely give an oral medication now. We talked about um, dosing, but in this video, I'm going to show you how to actually give the medication to your kitten safely. Um, because, you know, if you've got a respiratory infection kitten like chickpea, um, quite likely that you're going to be prescribed an antibiotic. And today is actually chickpea's last day of antibiotics. She's doing great. Um, but she's doing great because she was prescribed medication. Um, so here's how you actually safely give that medication. So now it's time for Chris to have his medication. Now kittens and cats have a nice little gap on the side of their mouth and it's perfect for opening up and wiggling a little syringe in there. What we wanna do is we wanna open the mouth from the side and we wanna squirt the medication onto their tongue. What you don't wanna do is squirt it from the front towards the back because the kitten can aspirate. We don't wanna cause aspiration, so we're not gonna shoot this towards the back of his mouth. We are going to slowly put it onto his tongue and let him swallow it. So I'll gently hold his head, wiggle this into the side, and apply it to the tongue. Good job! Way to go! Okay. Okay, now we're gonna watch a video about nebulizers. Now, nebulizers are um, a very affordable thing that foster parents can get, um, and a lot of foster programs have them that they can loan out to you. Um, if you foster frequently, might be worth investing in one. You can get one for about $35 online. Um, and a nebulizer is a really helpful tool for kittens who are having um, breathing issues. So we'll watch this little video now. A nebulizer is a device that changes liquids into a mist so that they can be inhaled into the lungs. These are used commonly in humans with asthma or pneumonia, but they can also be used with kittens. You can buy a nebulizer online for a pretty affordable price. And if you do a lot of rescue work with kittens, I do recommend getting one of these to keep on hand for any kittens that have respiratory distress. A nebulizer will have a small cup that you'll fill with either sterile saline or with a medication that is prescribed by your veterinarian. Fill the cup to the fluid line, then close the cup. Now you're ready to turn the nebulizer on and deliver the breathing therapy to the kitten. You don't want to do this loose in the room. Obviously, you want them to be enclosed so they can breathe in the mist and get all of those benefits. There are two ways you can do this. One, you can put the kitten in their kennel, add the nebulizer, and cover the kennel with a towel. Or two, the way I prefer to do it is with a plastic storage box with no lid. Then just drape a towel or blanket over the top. Never ever enclose a kitten in a solid box. Always make sure there's plenty of ventilation so they can breathe. Okay, so next you'll turn the nebulizer on and sit with the kitten to monitor how they're doing. The nebulizer solution will be inhaled and will help break up congestion in the lungs. Jumbo here is using a sterile saline, which has been really helpful with his moderate pneumonia. Okay. All right, so when should you intervene when these kittens have upper respiratory infections? Um, you know, I, I want people to obviously intervene whenever they're concerned about something. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Uh, but there are some times where you might see something that I would say, you know, that's just a case where you're gonna monitor. For instance, if a kitten just sneezes once or twice, um, you know, you're in the room with them and you just hear them go, Psst. Um, you know, just, that's a sign for monitoring, because sometimes kittens aren't sneezing because they have an upper respiratory infection. Sometimes you just sneeze. Um, if you see 
very frequent sneezing, that would be different. We want to take that kitten to a vet. Um, what about slight crust on the eyes upon waking? You know, sometimes you wake up in the morning and you've got a little bit of sleep in your eye. Um, that can happen with kittens too. If you see um, very mild uh, crusts to the eyes when they're waking up, then just monitor them. But if you see really goopy eyes or a goopy nose, green or yellow discharge, you can hear um, strange sounds when they're eating, definitely you need to intervene. And you don't want to wait until it gets really bad. You want to intervene right away. Eye infections. Um, this is very common in kittens uh, and, and actually some kittens can have an eye infection before their eyes even open. That's the case here. Um, but either way, uh, we want to address the issue. So first you have to identify the issue. Um, in a kitten whose eyes are opened, you're going to tell they have an eye infection because they're going to be really irritated looking or there's going to be discharge. It's going to be um, you know, a lot of uh, mucus around the eye or it's crusted shut like that. Um, you know, if you see that, then that is probably something where you want to uh, address this issue, talk to a vet. Um, now, in a kitten whose eyes are closed, you might notice that one of their eyes looks kind of strangely swollen or in the case of this kitten here, um, he has the, the inside of his eye looks like um, where his tear duct is, there's a little bit of pus forming there. So this kitten actually has um, neonate ophthalmia, which is an infection underneath the closed eye of a neonate. We're going to um, identify the issue, give them a warm compress. So here, this little guy is very small, so I'm using a, um, a warm, wet uh, cotton ball, and I'm just letting the mucus break up first so that I'm not like pulling off something really hard. Um, I put it on there. Please be very careful. Don't cover their nose. That's where they're breathing. So only cover the eye, let it break up and then wash that mucus away. You can flush with saline. Please only flush if you have saline. You're not going to put water in your kitten's eye. Um, if you have access to saline, which is that 0.9% um, sodium chloride. Um, you can flush the eye with saline just to get all the nasty stuff out of there. If you don't have that, just do the warm compress. Get the eye open and clean. Um, so that's, you know, if your kitten had an open eye already, but it's crusted shut, get it open. If you have a neonate and their eye is swollen and has pus underneath it, you do have to get the eye open. Um, get it open and then you can apply your veterinary antibiotic if necessary, if prescribed by your vet. Um, please do not ever put something in your kitten's eye that you weren't prescribed by a vet. Um, things like Neosporin, that's like an ointment that's not meant to go in a cat's eye. Please don't do that. Um, there are uh, ophthalmic antibiotics that you can get prescribed to you that go right in the kitten's eye. I mean, you just put a little strip of it across the eye and then you continue as needed. And you can see here um, after one day, he's doing a lot better. Um, so most of these little guys, um, they do pretty well after two, three days of um, this kind of care. Um, but there are definitely cases that are more severe. Um, you can see all sorts of different things with kittens and eyes. So if you see something that looks um, worse than just some mucus, you see like really serious swelling or redness, or you can see the conjunctiva, um, you got to go to a vet. I keep saying it over and over again, but it honestly applies everywhere. Go to a veterinarian. Okay, let's talk about fleas. Fleas are a big deal. They're a small, they're a small little animal, little bug, but they are a very, very big deal um, because they suck your kitten's blood and your kitten does not have a lot of blood um, left to spare. So kittens can have fatal anemia if they are left with a blood sucking parasite on them. So we got to get those fleas off of them right away. However, um, the, the medications that you're probably used to seeing for fleas, maybe you've seen the topical medications or even flea collars, those are not safe for working with little kittens. So instead, what we're going to do with our little babies is we're going to give them a bath. In this video, you're going to see how I identify that this kitten has fleas and then what I do about it. We're going to see if Clem has fleas. I'm going to take a flea comb, which has really tiny teeth on it, and we're just going to comb through his fur. See these little black specks that look like dirt? That is flea dirt. And that's a pretty good sign that this little guy has fleas. Anytime I take in a new kitten, I always comb through them 
with a flea comb to make sure I know if fleas are a concern. Fleas are a big problem for little kittens because fleas suck the kitten's blood and they don't have a lot of blood to spare. So when a kitten is left with an active flea infestation, they can actually have fatal anemia. So we wanna deal with these fleas right away. Even if you don't see a flea on your kitten, if you see flea dirt, those little suckers are hiding somewhere in there. Look at all that nasty flea dirt. You can do a little test by taking the comb and rubbing the dirt onto a little paper towel. Once it's on your paper towel, you can take some water or saline and you can wet it. What you'll see is that it actually starts to bleed red into the paper towel. That's because this is the flea's waste from consuming the blood of the kitten. Now Clem is only three weeks old, so he's too young to receive any of those topical treatments that you put on the back of a cat's neck. We're not gonna use harsh chemicals on this little guy. Instead, we're going to give him a flea bath. So let's go get set up. One of the first things we're going to do is we're gonna heat up a heat pad for them because we need them to be warm the moment they get out of the bath. So I'm gonna start that now. While their heat pad is warming up, I'm gonna collect my supplies. I'll need a couple of washcloths or hand towels, some small sponges or cotton balls, and some kind of sudsing cleanser. You can either use a baby shampoo or a dish soap as long as it is fragrance free. Now I'm gonna start the water and make sure that it is nice and warm. The first thing I'm gonna do is apply a light layer of soap and water around his neck. This acts as a barrier so that as we're washing him, the fleas can't travel up to his head. So there's his little fence. Now that he has that, I can wet the rest of his body. As you're washing him, the suds from the soap are going to break down the bodies of the fleas and actually kill the fleas. So they'll rinse right away along with the dirt and the eggs. You want the entire thing to take less than a minute. We're only washing from the neck down. You're gonna dry the kitten off as best as you can. And you can take a clean flea comb and comb out any fleas that didn't get rinsed away. Now we're going to use our little baby sponge. We're gonna wet our baby sponge and put a little bit of our baby shampoo on it. And then we are going to spot clean his head. So we wanna to try to really get in there around the ears, on the face, avoiding the eyes, avoiding the nose, avoiding the mouth. Now we can rinse the head with our sponge. All right, so I'm just getting all of that soap off of his head. Then we're gonna get you nice and dry and put you right back on your heated bed. Oh, poor little guy. He looks so sad at the end of that video. Uh, kittens do not appreciate a bath, so please don't bathe them unless you absolutely must. But in the case of fleas, you absolutely must. Um, make sure that you get them dry and warm immediately after because the bath can be traumatic to them. Cold can be traumatic to them, so let's get them warm right away. Um, Let's talk about ringworm now, another reason for baths and dips. Um, ringworm is something that you may see when you're fostering kittens, and I wanna say a lot of people get really, really freaked out about ringworm, but um, it is something that's totally treatable. Uh, ringworm is a fungal infection, it's not actually a worm, and it can cause fur loss and patchy lesions. Uh, the reason that people get concerned about ringworm is because it is zoonotic, which means that it can spread to other animals. So it can spread to you, your cat, your dog. Um, most of the time it is more common for it to spread to um, children or uh, seniors, uh, but uh, it can spread to anyone. So you do have to be prepared to handle these kittens um, as if they have a zoonotic disease. So um, we're gonna handle them with gloves, we're gonna keep them in a separate room, we're not gonna let children um, handle these kittens. Uh, we're going to you know, kind of keep them in a specific area while we are uh, giving them the care that they need to get rid of this ringworm. 
really the scariest thing about ringworm is just that um, you know kittens historically in the United States have occasionally um, in some programs been euthanized for ringworm uh, because it is something that spreads very quickly in a shelter environment. Um, so it's not that the disease itself is uh, fatal, but it can have um, some really negative implications for them um, in certain programs. So fostering kittens with ringworm is such a wonderful gift that you can give to these kittens. You get them out of the shelter, you protect the cats that are in the shelter, um, you protect the staff, um, and you bring those kittens home. And you know, it's just gonna take uh, a couple weeks uh, in your care um, to get these kittens ringworm free. Okay, let's watch a little video about ringworm here and then we'll talk about what we learned. How will you know if a kitten has ringworm? If you can see any signs of hair loss or skin irritation, it's good to talk to a vet to rule out this funky fungus. A vet can do a skin scrape and culture it to confirm presence of the fungus. In some cases, these confirmatory tests can take a long time, so it's often good to go ahead and get started with your treatment if the vet does suspect ringworm. The other common method for diagnosing ringworm is a black light or a wood flame. Certain strains of ringworm will glow under a black light. So when you shine it on them, you may see that their patchy parts look bright purple. Just be careful using this method because not all strains of ringworm will glow. And there are things that will glow that are not ringworm, like certain fibers or food residue. Let's talk about baths and dips. Twice a week, you're going to bathe or dip your kitten in a medicated bath. There are several different kinds, but first I'll talk about the most commonly used method for working with ringworm kittens, which is lime sulfur dip. Lime sulfur dip is an antimicrobial concentrate that kills fungi. It has a pungent smell like rotten eggs, so it's kind of gross to work with, but it's very effective and it's affordable. You'll follow the instructions on the bottle to dilute the concentrate, and then you'll dip the kittens into the solution, carefully coating their body. Use a washcloth or a cotton pad to carefully apply the dip to the face, avoiding the eyes. Once the kitten is dipped in the lime sulfur, that's it. Don't rinse them, just let them dry completely. The sulfur smell will dissipate as it dries, and that dip will get to work on killing all the spores. Now I use a different medicated bath that contains the antiseptic chlorhexidine and the antifungal ketoconazole. This shampoo is a prescription strength and you have to get it from a veterinarian. There are other similar shampoos you can get, so talk to your veterinarian about the best shampoo for your kittens. And make sure you're using something that is specifically created for cats. Using the shampoo method, you'll wash the kitten with the shampoo thoroughly, being very careful while washing the face using a cloth or cotton pad. Be careful not to get the shampoo into the eyes. Once the kitten is covered in the shampoo, you'll leave the product on for five to 10 minutes, then thoroughly rinse it off of them and get them dry and warm as fast as possible. You should be aware that dips and baths can be very traumatic to kittens because they're made to be wet for a period of time. So warm up a heat pad ahead of time and make sure that they are kept warm throughout the entire process. Remember that for young kittens, being cold is a big deal, so don't skip this step. Keep them warm. After I do my shampoo baths, I always dry the kittens immediately and place them on a blanket with a heat pad underneath it. Next, let's talk about topical treatments. There are many topical antifungal treatments, and what's important is that you're using one that is effective and safe for cats. After the kitten's bath, I put this on their active lesions. On days that the kittens don't get their bath, I clean the lesions using a gauze pad soaked in chlorhexidine. This cleans and prepares the area to be treated using the ointment. My kittens get this ointment once a day, but other topical treatments may be used more frequently. Of course, talk to your vet before using any over-the-counter medication on your kittens and make sure it's safe for them. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information, so let's kind of break all of that down. Um, the, the thing about ringworm and treating kittens with ringworm is that it's often multimodal, which means you're doing a couple different things. You might be doing a dip or a bath, you might be doing an oral medication, 
in most cases, you're going to be doing some kind of topical medication. And there's so many different ways that this is done that I can't really tell you exactly what you should do um, other than to, of course, say, talk to your vet about what they would recommend using. Um, the thing that I will say is that the most common is the lime sulfur dip. Um, powerful antifungal, smells really nasty, um, probably something you'll encounter if you work with ringworm kittens. Uh, but don't be afraid to use this. Just put some gloves on and you'll get through it. Uh, support the skin also, you know, um, these are really caustic things that we're doing. So, um, vitamin E oil is something that you can, um, put topically on kittens to help them, uh, with just keeping their skin healthy, but be aware that you can overdo that. So once a day or as needed, um, a light layer of that on any of the lesions can help with irritated skin. The skin is um, an organ that wants to heal itself. So when we support it and help it heal itself, um, you know, it's going to be doing some of the work too while we are doing some of this more caustic stuff um, topically and uh, with the dips and all of that. Oh my gosh, you guys, we have a lot to talk about and I want to make sure I'm getting through all of this, but also not taking up your entire Saturday. So um, quickly, I'm going to talk about this. And the thing about <clears throat> talking about viruses is, you know, it's important to understand what some of the common viruses are, but for foster parents, um, you don't need to be a viral expert um, and understand what you know, what the real details are of all each of these viruses. The important thing for you to know is how to kind of recognize them, understand a little bit about what they are, and then most importantly, know um, how to do just any supportive care for any of the symptoms that are associated with these viruses. So let's go through some of the common viruses that you might um, you might experience at some point with a kitten. Rhinotracheitis, that is, um, you know, a, it's the R and the FVRCP vaccine. Um, and that really is uh, a virus that's causing a lot of these upper respiratory symptoms that we see in kittens, like, um, you know, kittens who are having a lot of those symptoms like chickpea. Um, Khaleesi virus is something that you might encounter. Panleukopenia is a really serious one um, that we'll talk about. And then there are these um, other viruses that you know you hear about a lot. Um, feline leukemia and FIV are uh, commonly tested for in kittens pre-adoption, so we'll mention those. And then FIP is another one that people often will ask about, so I'll talk about that too. Um, but the important thing to know about any virus is a virus can't be stopped in its tracks. Um, you can really just prevent viruses and then when they occur, um, provide supportive care for the specific symptoms. So Khaleesi virus, we didn't talk about yet. Um, this is Nanichi, one of my recent foster kittens who had Khaleesi virus. Um, symptoms tend to last one to three weeks um, and it can appear a couple different ways. A lot of the time they have those respiratory congestion, sneezing, nasal, and ocular discharge. Um, but a lot of the time with Khaleesi virus, there is also um, ulceration of the lips or tongue or gums. Um, and so this is, if you see like ulcers on, on or around the mouth or inside the mouth, I would be thinking maybe you need to talk to a veterinarian and see if this kitten could have Khaleesi virus. Um, the other way that this can express is painful joints, lameness of the limbs and limping. That was the form of Khaleesi virus that uh, Nanichi had. And sometimes kittens can have both oral ulcers and limping. Sometimes they just have one or the other. Um, fever and trembling is also common with these kittens. Um, but the important thing to know is that it's spread um, via direct contact or through the air or through contaminated objects. So, you know, you touch a kitten, you touch your cell phone, your cell phone you put down in another kitten's area, and now that object has contaminated the other kitten. So this is why we want to be so cautious about um, introducing kittens uh, too early in their in their um, time with us. Um, please, you know, just treat them for whatever specific symptoms come up. Um, this is symptom management and Khaleesi virus is something that passes, passes after, um, you know, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, but we just gotta get them through. So deal with each symptom as it comes. Panleukopenia, similar in that it is, we're really just, 
uh, trying to get them through this rough period of time. Pan Luke usually is going to last three to seven days, and it is, I'm not going to lie, this is a gnarly one, you guys. We really want to avoid kittens having Pan Luke. This is baby Hank. She's the kitten that's on the cover of my book, and she's also a Pan Luke survivor. Um, if you see kittens who have nausea, liquid diarrhea, dehydration, lethargy, high fever, rapid decline, like they're fine and all of a sudden they're really not fine, please isolate that kitten right away, get them tested for panleukopenia, and even if that test is going to take some time to come back, please start acting as if they have panleukopenia right away. Because whether it's negative or uh, positive, it's you're going to benefit from isolating that kitten and um, providing supportive care to them. This is a highly transmissible uh, virus that can live for up to a year and <clears throat> in the environment if you don't sanitize properly. So this is another reason that I'm a big fan of keeping kittens contained. You can see spinach up there in her little playpen. You know, heaven forbid, if spinach ended up having panleukopenia, it would be a lot easier for me to sanitize that space. Um, I can wash everything that's in there. I can toss stuff if I need to, but she has not now contaminated my whole house, right? Um, so uh, provide support for the specific symptoms that come up, um, and we'll talk about supportive care in a moment. Um, vaccination, you know, it shouldn't take a global pandemic to let everyone know how important it is to um, develop and have vaccines uh, for viruses. It's very important. And the FVRCP vaccine is the uh, the vaccine that every cat is going to receive. It's considered a core vaccine, which means that every cat should have it. Um, it typically is going to start around six weeks. Some programs start it around eight weeks. Some programs start it a little younger. Um, talk to your vet about what age is right for you. We do six weeks with Orphan Kitten Club. Um, and then typically a booster is given every two to four weeks. But check it out. What does FVRCP stand for? It stands for feline, viral, rhinotracheitis, Khaleesi virus, and panleukopenia. So this uh, very important vaccine series is actually protecting our kittens from these horrible viruses. So please vaccinate your kittens. It's very serious. They don't have to go through all of this. Um, the rabies vaccine um, is another core vaccine. Um, in many states, it's uh, legally required to have this vaccine. So talk to your vet about when that's appropriate. It's typically um, going to be given sometime between 12 and 16 weeks, which means a lot of the time, if you're raising a bottle baby, you know the kitten will get this vaccine once they've already been adopted. Okay. Oh my gosh, we have so much to talk about. <sighs> FIV. FIV is not actually very common in these little kittens. However, um, it is something that you might uh, be thinking about because you're often getting your kittens tested for FIV and leukemia before um, adoption. So the main thing I want to talk about with FIV is just how the test works. So the test for FIV is actually looking at antibodies. It's not looking at the disease itself. It's looking for antibodies, which is um, the body's uh, defense against the disease. So a kitten can test positive for FIV if they have the antibodies, but they can have the antibodies because they actually got them passed down by mom. If mom had FIV or if mom was vaccinated against FIV, she can pass those antibodies to her kittens. And in those first weeks of life, um, they might still have those antibodies. So if a kitten tests positive for FIV, does not mean that they have FIV. It means that you're gonna retest them at six months once those maternal antibodies have worn off, okay? Um, now, if we have a kitten uh, who tests positive, like Blossom in this picture was a kitten I had who tested positive for FIV, um, that is not a cause to panic. Uh, all that we will do then is we will adopt them out with a little letter, um, making sure that the adopter knows this kitten tested positive for FIV. They need to be retested at six months. We basically most of the time see that those tests come back negative at six months. Um, but if in the rare situation they do actually um, test positive, uh, you know, we research shows that FIV cats um, really they transmit it to each other um, through deep bite wounds, which is not 
um, such a concern in a carefully managed household. Um, you know, it's it's more of a concern. We call it a fighter disease. It's a concern among you know unsterilized tomcats who are fighting each other in alleyways. Um, so uh, research does show that FIV cats can can live um, long, happy lives and can cohabit with other non-FIV cats as long as um, there's not uh, really aggressive fighting happening. Now, leukemia is um, often done in a combination test with uh, FIV. So you'll see they got their FIV leukemia test or FELV, feline leukemia virus test. Um, this is another case where uh, testing is not the easiest thing for these little ones. Um, it might not be conclusive until six months, but it's actually a different test. This test is um, an antigen test. So it's looking for the actual virus itself. Um, so you might have um, some interesting results depending on when the kitten was exposed to the virus and whether the kitten is able to fight off the virus. Now, leukemia, if a kitten tests positive for leukemia, um, that should never be a reason to result in euthanasia unless they have severe symptoms um, where they that would be a consideration anyway. Um, but uh, you know, treatment decisions should be made based on the severity of symptoms. Many of these kittens are not going to be symptomatic, um, and many of them can live long, happy lives. Um, Beignet is a kitten in this picture who I had four and a half years ago, and she tested positive for leukemia. She did truly have leukemia, um, but four and a half years later, she's still doing great. Um, so these kittens can um, can be adopted. However, you want to adopt them into homes um, where they're the solo cat or they're in a home with other um, leukemia positive cats. Um, and that is because leukemia in cats is a lover disease. So they actually um, transmit this through things like prolonged proximity and grooming of one another. Um, so let's try to protect other cats from getting that. Okay. FIP is another really um, hot topic right now because it is something that um, for a very long time was considered not treatable and now there's a lot of research um, coming out showing that there might be um, might be treatment on the horizon. I can't speak specifically to any of that because it's all ongoing, but I do recommend that if you get a kitten who um, you believe has FI FIP, um, then you should talk to a vet and see if you can find a vet who's willing to do one of these kind of cutting edge treatments that um, are coming out right now. Um, so symptoms of FIP would be things like um, an unkempt coat, neurological symptoms, high fever of unknown origin, um, weight loss, really like lethargic. And then um, in wet FIP, you might also see that their abdomen seems to be becoming enlarged um, with fluid. Uh, so talk to your vet if you see these things. Um, most cases, you know, you don't see a lot of FIP kittens in my care because my kittens typically get adopted between eight and nine weeks old. And in most cases, FIP is going to um, show up a little bit later in kittens um, because it's a mutation of the feline coronavirus different coronavirus than COVID-19. This is a different different virus, um, but it's a mutation of a common virus. So um, it can take several weeks for that to show up in a kitten. And in most cases, they'll be, you know, maybe three months plus when um, that becomes an issue. The kitten in this picture is um, uh, one of the kittens from one of the partner groups of my nonprofit who's currently being treated with um, some of those new uh, medications that are being kind of researched around FIP. We hope that uh, this kitten will do great. All right, so what do you do when a kitten has a virus? Well, um, you know, the first thing is you want to quarantine them from other animals. Um, you know, I would say in any case, except for if they test positive for FIV, um, any of those other viruses like panleukopenia, Khaleesi virus, let's quarantine them from other animals. Um, oh, her little spinach has gauze sticking out of her side. I'm going to have to wrap her up after this. Ah, <sighs> man, she's got a lot going on. Okay. Um, you know, you want to obviously bring them to a veterinarian for an assessment and treatment plan. Um, only the veterinarian can diagnose the virus and only a veterinarian can um, provide you with a, a good treatment plan for them. But at home, monitoring is going to increase. So you're going to be monitoring their temperature, their weight, their symptoms, care provided. I make like a big chart when I'm caring for a kitten with a virus and write down everything that's going on so that you can tell, you know, if things are getting worse, better, how's their temperature, 
um, you know, um, and then provide supportive care for each symptom. So what does supportive care mean? I keep saying provide supportive care, provide supportive care. Um, I think that my fostering journey with medical kittens improved around the time that I realized that, you know, taking care of, of sick kittens um, with, of course, a veterinarian helping you, um, it's less about understanding a specific disease and it's more about understanding specific symptoms. So that's why I'm teaching you about dehydration, about proper nutrition, about dealing with kittens who are cold. All of these are symptoms and they can pop up with lots of different things that are going on, um, whether it's a virus or some kind of infection or a parasite that's making their body spin out of control. You're going to be seeing um, not like uh, bullet points on a, on a, a disease, you're seeing, you're seeing symptoms. Um, and especially in the case of viruses, um, you're really just trying to get the kitten through that horrible period of that virus by helping them with their specific symptoms. So notice their symptoms, monitor their symptoms. If something's going on, deal with the, the actual symptom as it arises. If they're too hot, deal with that. If they're too cold, deal with that. Um, if they're in pain, please get pain management for your kittens from your vet. You can ask your vet for pain management. They can have that. Um, so supportive care just means being really mindful of specific, um, specific symptoms as they arise and dealing with them. But of course, only provide supportive care under supervision of a vet. So this is what I'm talking about. Prevent, monitor, intervene. This is where all of this kind of comes together. And um, we're monitoring our kittens. We're preventing viruses where we can. We're preventing parasites where we can. Um, we're making sure that we keep a good eye on them. And then we're intervening when something goes on. Um, early intervention means that you have to address any real red flags with, with haste. So lethargy, weight loss, dehydration, fever, diarrhea, constipation, um, you know, these things might seem like not a big deal when they first come up, but they become a big deal very quickly in kittens. Um, there is kind of this domino effect that happens. For instance, um, you know, the kitten in this picture, small fry, she just had a um, upper respiratory infection, but it made her unable to nurse on her mom. And so then she started losing weight and then she got dehydrated and now her organs are shutting down and everything's falling apart. Um, and, and we could have addressed that early on by simply dealing with the, the respiratory issue, right? Um, so early intervention is really the number one key. Okay, so let's, let's kind of put this into a real world scenario. What happens when you rescue a kitten you just got home a new kitten and they're like a hot mess. They have a hundred different things wrong with them. Um, this is a kitten who she had a lot going on. This is Fire Crown. Fire Crown, when I got her, was underweight. She was emaciated. She was dehydrated. She was cold. She was covered in waste and she had fleas all over her. So what do you do? How do you know what to do first? You know, you learn some of these skills, but what order, what's the order of operations here? Oh. So the priority of care at first rescue is, first of all, any like immediate emergencies need to be dealt with. So obviously if you get a kitten in and they're having a seizure or if they are bleeding excessively, you're not going to be thinking, oh, let's you know, give them a bath. You're going to be thinking, okay, let's get this kitten to an emergency vet. Deal with those emergencies right away. Um, the next thing you're going to be thinking about is their temperature. Get the kitten warm. We talked about how you should not be feeding a cold kitten, so please get the kitten warm right away. Um, once the kitten is warm and any emergencies have been dealt with, that's when we can hydrate and or feed our kitten. And then once the kitten is a little more stable, for instance, um, they're, they're nice and warm, they've had a good meal, they're not having any emergencies, that's when we can deal with the non-emergency physical conditions, like if their eyes are crested shut. You know, once they've dealt with those other things, now we can go, okay, let's get, let's get a warm compress on your eyes. And then the fifth thing would be cleaning and washing. In this kitten's case, she had so many things going on. I'm not going to take this cold, hypothermic, starving kitten and give her a flea bath right now. Um, we want to make sure that happens, but I'm going to get her stable first. So I'll do the bath maybe um, day two or 12 hours in or something like that. Um, so this is hopefully helpful because I think we don't always talk about the order of operations, but it is important to do things in the right order. And there she is. Um, you know, you can see how bad she looked there. A couple days later, she looked like 
like that on the left and then she grew into one of the most beautiful kittens ever. Um, you can really um, put some nice shine on these kittens, make them look so sparkly and beautiful. Uh, okay, critical kittens. So a critical kitten is a kitten who is in severe medical distress. These kittens need to go to a veterinary hospital um, like right now. And um, a critical kitten is one who has extreme lethargy. They can't like walk around, get up, lift their head. Um, a critical kitten might have a very gaunt or triangular look to their face. It's called muscle wasting. Um, that's the muscles of the body wasting away. Liquid diarrhea is a critical issue. We've got to deal with that right away. If they're severely emaciated, you can feel all their rib cage. Um, if they're severely dehydrated and have pale or dry gums. And then agonal breathing. This is where kittens are breathing through their mouth. <sighs> this is, that's agonal breathing. That is not normal. Um, these are all signs that we got to address this right now and we're not going to do it in our home. Um, we're going to do it with a veterinarian. Um, so uh, be mindful that, you know, there are things that we can try to do, but in some cases, um, the most humane option is euthanasia for some kittens who are in severe condition. And how do you make that determination? I mean, it is hard. Um, but for me, the way that I make that determination is if the kitten is very seriously suffering and is um, going to be dying naturally within the next day, um, I think that it is the more humane thing to do to um, relieve them of that misery through humane euthanasia. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to try. If a kitten has a little bit of light left in their eyes and, you know, you have a good vet who can help you um, do some of this supportive care, don't be afraid to try, but forgive your yourself um, if something goes wrong if the kitten's not able to survive that happens and and I'm going to talk about that now because uh, you have to know when you're working with really sick kittens um, you are going to lose some of them and that is part of working with such a vulnerable population if a kitten passes the first thing is be kind to yourself this is so traumatic to go through um, if a kitten passes you know let yourself cry for a moment. Um, be kind. Be loving to yourself. Don't think negative thoughts about yourself. Think loving thoughts for yourself. You're going through something traumatic. Call your foster coordinator and let them know. Um, you know, you're going to have the kitten's remains. You can return them to the shelter or you can bring them to a veterinarian. Um, the veterinarian can help with those remains. Um, you also want to give yourself time to grieve. Um, don't just you know, jump right into fostering more kittens unless that's the right way of grieving for you. Everyone grieves differently and there's no right way. So I can't tell you, here's how you grieve. Um, you know, some people want to talk about it a lot. Um, that's me during the first day. I call all of my rescue friends and I talk it out. Um, some people don't want to talk about it. You want to just watch the Harry Potter series? Do that. Sometimes, you know, that I, I went through something like this, a very traumatic loss um, a few months ago. And I was like, I'm just going to watch the Harry Potter, <laughs> all the Harry Potter movies for a couple days. And you know what? That helped me. Um, you know, it's all about whatever you need in the moment to get through your um, really difficult moment. So do whatever you need to do to um, grieve in the way that's right for you. Don't forget to sanitize your supplies. If your kitten has passed from um, a, a transmissible illness, let's avoid that happening to any future kittens. Sanitize your space and your supplies. And then take a break, and when you're ready, dive back in. Please don't let loss deter you from continuing to foster uh, because it's those of us who go through loss and who go through these very um, difficult trials with our kittens, we're the ones who end up getting the experience that can save future lives. And the number one thing I'll say about having experienced loss with my kittens is that there's not been a kitten I've lost who has not taught me something that has helped me save a future kitten. Every kitten teaches you a lesson, and that is the gift of these little lives, even if they're only with us for a short period of time, even if we lose them. Um, these are little teachers, and you're their student, and I think the kindest thing that we can do to honor their memory is to save more lives um, with the, the skills that we learn from them. Um, I'm very grateful to every kitten I've ever cared for for teaching me so much. Oh, okay. Anyway... 
cleaning and sanitizing is very important. Um, and I hope that I've emphasized why it's so important because we're dealing with a lot of nasty stuff here and we want to protect everyone. Um, you guys know, because we're going through a global pandemic right now, that sanitizing is really, really key. Um, but if you're someone like me, you already had really nice sanitizing stuff at home. Um, I stock disinfectant and I use it all the time. Um, now there's a difference between cleaning and sanitizing and or disinfecting. Um, and the difference is that cleaning kind of makes your space look nice, smell nice, um, but sanitizing is actually um, cleaning at the molecular level. So you're getting rid of viruses and bacteria and fungal spores and all of the stuff that can be transmitting illness to your babies. So um, please make sure that you are thinking not just about sanitizing like their supplies, like you know their blankets and the playpen that they're in, but you want to actually sanitize um, frequently touched items like your faucet, your doorknob, your light switch, your cell phone. Um, this is, you know, really good advice. I'm constantly walking around spritzing everything, especially these days. Spray the doorknob, spray the light switch. Opt for sanitizable surfaces. You don't want to take a brand new sick kitten home and put them on your couch because that's not as easy to sanitize. So this is why you see me using, you know, metal surfaces, plastic surfaces, things that can be thrown in the washing machine, things that can be discarded. Know your disinfectant. There's lots, there's lots of different types of disinfectants. The one that I use is called Rescue, and you can see that um, there is a concentrated version on the left. There's also a ready-to-use version. And then bleach is definitely the, the most common disinfectant. But please look at the instructions on the bottle because all disinfectants are different. They have different um, concentrations that you need to do. Like with bleach, you're not just putting straight bleach on something. You're, um, that bleach is diluted uh, or is concentrated and you need to dilute it. So follow the instructions on the back um, to mix it properly. Uh, make sure that you know if there's a specific contact time. So like with Rescue, you don't just spray and then wipe it away. You spray and you leave it on for a period of time and then you can wipe it away. Um, and make sure that you're using something animal safe. Okay, we'll just briefly go through all of this because it's, it's honestly a lot of the advice um, applies to many different forms of sanitizing. Bottles and food dishes, um, you can actually just sanitize them in uh, very hot water or boiling water. Um, that can kill the antigens. So first you wanna obviously clean it. So I'll use like your hot soapy water to scrub away visible debris. Then you can put it on a hot dishwasher, dishwasher cycle or um, use a bottle sterilizer. The thing on the bottom left is like for human babies, you put it in your microwave um, or use boiling water. Floors and walls, again, you're cleaning first. So clean any visible debris. You're never like sanitizing on top of a pile of poop. Clean the poop, then sanitize. Um, so use, you know, a, a broom, um, and then you can mop up the area with uh, your chosen disinfectant. Carriers and play pens, um, you know, clean the area first. Make sure you remove any visible debris, and then use your spray bottle with your chosen disinfectant. Um, Soft furniture and carpets, I highly recommend avoiding um, unless the kitten has been with you for a long time and you know they're healthy. Uh, but if you do have a kitten uh, that goes on a soft furniture or carpet, you can use a vacuum to remove as much debris as possible and then use a steam cleaner to sanitize the item. Sometimes you can also use your spray disinfectant, but I don't want you to you know, accidentally bleach your couch. So um, if you're not sure if it's safe to do, you can do a little test swab on the back and make sure that you're not damaging anything and then toys and bedding throw it in the washing machine throw it in the washing machine you can you know use some of your disinfectant in the washing machine dry it on high heat all right we're coming to the end guys I promise I talk so much I hope this is still interesting to you because I could talk for like five hours about kitten health probably longer <laughs> but um I hope you're still with me because this is a really important one. Quarantine, AKA social distancing for kittens. You guys know all about this now um, because we are all <laughs> in our own quarantines right now at home. Um, but this is not new for kittens. Uh, for kittens, we always wanna be doing that 14 day minimum quarantine. This means when a kitten first comes in, we go, I don't know what's going on with you. I'm gonna put you in quarantine for 14 days before I let you meet any other animals that you're not related to. Um, so this picture here is Bruno and Boop. These are two 
solo kittens that are not related. So they don't know each other. They're not from the same same household, if you will. Just like right now, we're all quarantining in our homes. You can quarantine with your family, but you can't quarantine with the stranger down the street who you don't know, right? So keep kittens with their family groups for 14 days, monitor them, wash your hands, use different supplies, sanitize everything. And then after two weeks, if everybody's healthy and everybody's had their preventative care and no one has anything they can pass to the other, you can actually introduce them. Um, and it's worth the wait. Um, so let's watch a little video about that. When introducing a little one to a critter from another litter, you want to do so with their health and safety in mind. It might be tempting to quickly place two kittens together, but nobody should be booping noses or licking faces until it's the right time for friendship. The reason it's important not to introduce two kittens from a different litter right away is because most of the time when you rescue a kitten, they're going to have an unknown health history. And these kittens can carry infectious diseases like parasites and viruses that can be contagious to one another. That's why when you have two kittens from different groups, I always recommend a minimum two week quarantine period. During these two weeks, kittens should be receiving preventative care like dewormers or even vaccines if age appropriate. During these two weeks, you wanna be observing their health. Make sure their poop is well formed and that they don't have any parasites they can spread. Make sure their skin is healthy and that they don't have ringworm. Make sure they don't have an upper respiratory infection or any signs of a virus. You also want to make sure you're using separate supplies. Many contagious illnesses can be spread through environmental contact, things like food dishes and bottles and blankets. So you don't want to be sharing any of these supplies between two different litters. Wash your hands between each group practice good hygiene, and make sure that the kittens really are separate during this time. Of course, litter mates can stay together and share supplies since they're a package deal, but they shouldn't be sharing space or supplies with any other litters until their bodies are ready for forming feline friendships. Okay, so separate litters, separate supplies, just like you can share space with your your family, you know, you guys are all sharing a living room couch. Um, you know, these kittens can share with their family group, but not with animals that they don't know until they have passed their quarantine period. So these are just a couple supplies. Um, toothbrushes you can use for grooming your kittens, your bottle, your litter boxes. You would actually need two sets if you're fostering two groups of kittens. Strict quarantine is um, when you have a kitten who has a very highly contagious illness. You want to just be um, doing some extra steps. Now, you don't need to be, you know, in your foster home every day wearing gloves and a smock and booties. But if you have a kitten who has a very contagious illness, something like panleukopenia, you do want to be extra cautious. Gloves, you don't need to get like a, a professional PPE gown, but, you know, I'll take an extra large t-shirt and leave it in the room and wear that when I'm wearing Working with them, tie your hair up so your hair is not touching them and then touching other things in the environment. Um, make sure that you are giving a little bit of uh, greater physical separation between kittens for things like pan luke or um, ringworm. And then be really cautious about sanitizing potentially contaminated objects. For instance, if I have a kitten with pan luke, I'm not going to bring my cell phone in there with me. Um, I'll just leave it out because I don't want anything to get contaminated. But the first play date is worth the wait. This is Bruno and Boop on their first play date. And these guys were raised as solo babies for the first like two, three weeks of their lives. Um, and then they finally got to become best friends. So um, I want to emphasize that having kittens meet each other is awesome, but you want to do it on a safe timeline. Take it from me. You're not going to be happy when you introduce an illness to a kitten um, that could have been avoided. So please do um, have that quarantine period and then you can celebrate with a little play date like this. Okay, we're coming to the end. So um, one of the last things kittens are gonna go through before they get adopted is spay and neuter. Um, you can follow your veterinarian's uh, pre-operative instructions. They're gonna let you know when you make the appointment or the foster program will let you know. Um, typically, the pre-operative instructions are just um, to take away food at a certain hour. And I wanna note that um, adult cats and kittens might have a different hour that you're pulling their food. Uh, the reason for that is that um, an adult cat eats less frequently than a kitten, and a kitten needs more frequent nutrition um, in order to, uh, you know, stay healthy. And, uh, you know, so 
maybe for an adult cat, they might say, don't give them anything to eat after 7 p.m. or something like that. And then for a young kitten, they might say, don't give them anything to eat after 10 p.m. Um, it really varies. So talk to your veterinarian and just follow whatever their preoperative instructions are. After surgery, follow the postoperative instructions. It might include um, giving oral pain medication. I definitely am a fan of making sure our kittens have um, proper pain medication. Um, so just follow whatever your vet recommends. And then you want to limit physical activity to the best of your ability for the first 48 hours. And I don't mean that you need to like wrap them up in a straight jacket and keep them still. Um, I just mean don't like encourage play and jumping. Don't like take a wand toy in there with a kitten who is just spayed. You know, no encouraging jumping or strenuous movement when they're recovering. Okay, the last thing I want to say, and I'm not going to teach you about all of these congenital differences. I wish I could because this is one of my favorite things. But um, there are kittens who have um, things that are medical conditions that um, actually they can just live with or you can help them with um, that are, you know, more like special needs and congenital differences. And um, that's the case with the kittens up there that we were looking at, um, spinach and chickpea who still are just sleeping. They've been very, uh, very tired this whole time, which is normal for their age. Um, both of them have congenital differences and the kittens on this screen are some that I've fostered. Um, upper left is Chloe and she's paralyzed. You can see she doesn't have use of her hind limbs. Um, upper right is Jez, and he's a kitten who um, is a tripod. He's missing one of his back legs. Uh, the bottom left is Petunia, and she's a kitten who had uh, mega esophagus, which is a condition that can cause regurgitation in kittens. Um, and then the bottom right is Apple, and you can see Apple's hind legs are shaped almost like a frog. Um, they go out to the side. And so all of these kittens, the only thing I want you to know here is Kittens can thrive even with physical differences, just like a human can thrive with physical differences. Our bodies are not all going to look the same, but that doesn't mean we can't have a beautiful, happy, wonderful life. Um, so we really ought to be giving these kittens the same opportunity. Um, so I love working with these little ones and I'm gonna end this talk with a quick little clip of Apple. Um, Apple is the kitten in the bottom right and she had swimmer syndrome and i'm going to show you how giving a little bit of a, a chance to a kitten like this can really improve their life i call it stubborn hope hello this is my new foster kitten apple hi apple apple is a very special kitten because she has a condition called swimmer syndrome and you can see her little legs kind of splay out to the side so instead of her feet going down underneath her body they go out to the side kind of like she's doing the breast stroke look at those cute little legs can you get yourself up that's a little tricky we're gonna fix you right up girlfriend look at that that is not a normal leg position girl these little legs need to be able to go underneath her body in order for her to walk normally. Instead of going out to the side, I want her hips to come in. So we want these hips to come in and we want the feet to be able to go underneath her body like that. So she can move her feet that direction, but as soon as I let go, woo, it all goes out to the side. This is her at the veterinarian, learning about wrapping legs, practicing. Guys, here's Apple, and Apple was our swimmer syndrome kitten. When we got Apple, her legs were all splayed out to the side, but here she is now. Look at those legs. What I have to put up with. Ah! <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, she certainly doesn't have any trouble running. Stubborn hopefulness is this quality that I think every rescuer should try to possess, where we 
feel very stubborn in our belief that a positive outcome is possible, that makes us determined to make it so. And hopefulness means that when we see an animal in distress, we don't just see the sorrowful situation, we see the potential future in them. Okay, I love Apple, I love her story. So this whole talk I've been saying, work with a vet, work with a vet, work with a vet, but how do you find a really good kitten-friendly vet? Because the truth is, not every veterinarian um, works closely with kittens, especially neonatal kittens or kittens with um, these medical uh, needs that can be a little bit more rare, like congenital conditions. So um, the first thing I would say is, Really work with a rescue organization. If you're fostering independently, I highly, highly encourage you to work with an organization because the organization is very likely to have identified a wonderful vet uh, who is going to have a lot more experience um, than maybe a private practice vet because they're actually seeing these really interesting cases that are coming through a shelter system or through a rescue organization. So if you work with an organization, they're gonna have a vet um, and you just work with that vet that the organization works with. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to find a vet on your own, I highly recommend trying to find someone with a background in shelter medicine because they're probably more likely to um, have seen some of these young neonatal kittens or kittens with um, different interesting medical needs. Um, I also recommend trying a feline-focused practice. So there are veterinarians that um, see cats and dogs. There are veterinarians that see everyone, including, you know, bunnies and lizards, um, and then there are veterinarians who are species specific, so vets that only see cats. And I have my best experience typically at a cat veterinarian because um, they're going to have a lot more familiarity with some of these uh, specific feline issues, so try that. Um, you also want to establish a relationship with them, so you can, you can you know, really try to um, become part of a community with this veterinarian. My veterinarians, um, we love them so much and you know, we thank them and we make sure that they feel that we're grateful and we make sure that they feel that we're being a strong partner with them. Um, and you know, you can ask them then to teach you supportive care skills, teach you some of these things that can be life-saving. Um, if you're not sure if a veterinarian has experience with feline pediatrics, you can just call and ask. Call and ask to talk to the practice manager and you know, ask them questions about you know do they have experience working with neonates um, you know what kind of uh, comfort level do they have with working with some of these tiny guys and just keep trying you're gonna find someone awesome in your community but um, remember that this is a two-way street it's a relationship and so in any relationship uh, communication is really important ask questions, provide advocacy for your kitten, um, give them all of the background information, build a positive relationship, and that's gonna, you know, you're gonna be able to do a lot together. The last thing that I'll say is that, um, you know, proper proper care, just the proper husbandry and care of, of kittens really does lead to better health. Um, you know, it, it should be obvious that if you're uh, feeding a kitten a good nutritious diet, if you are feeding them on an appropriate schedule, if you are um, helping them, uh, you know, behaviorally and you're helping them uh, you know, just with proper care in your home, that's going to lead to a better health and outcome for your kittens. So, um, you know, there's a lot that I didn't cover in this webinar that I did cover in webinars one and two. So if you have not watched those, please go back to um, the, the first and second webinar and watch them because that really plays a big factor also in the health and outcomes of your kittens. The next webinar is going to be next Saturday. It is on the subject of feral felines and kittens found outdoors. This is a really fun and adventurous subject because we're going to talk all about the great outdoors. What happens when you find a kitten? How do you manage those situations? What if you get a box full of kittens that looks like this and they're hissing at you? Um, you know, how do you handle these different things? So we'll talk about that next week. That'll be May 9th at 11 a.m. Pacific. 2 p.m. Eastern. I hope that I'll see some of you there for that. 
Remember, there are lots of educational resources on my website um, and on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash kittenlady. Um, I have lots of um, educational materials and I'll be sending some additional out to everybody who registered for the workshop today. A lot of this information is in my book, you guys, Tiny But Mighty. So if you're interested in learning more about kitten care, um, you know, I've been talking for almost two and a half hours. I apologize for how long I talk. I'm very passionate about this subject, but um, Tiny But Mighty, if you get it as an audiobook, is about 10 hours long. So you can learn a lot more in Tiny But Mighty. And of course, my website. Royal Canin has some wonderful resources about kitten health. Um, you can access them on their website, but the thing that I really, really wanna call your attention to is right here. They have a wonderful program available through May 31st. I know some people are having a difficult time accessing their veterinarians right now, and so they have um, put together this wonderful program where you can chat with a veterinarian for free 24-7 um, now through May 31st. So please check that out on their website. Um, that's a really, really great program and I'm so grateful to them for the ways that they've really stepped up um, as a leader in this important and um, unprecedented time. Um, you know, I think that we, this is something we can all get through together, uh, but thankfully uh, these resources have made it a little bit easier for people. So if you're having a hard time reaching a vet, check out their website and find out about that program. Okay, so now we're going to move on to questions. And thank you to anyone who's still watching. I know that uh, I talk a lot, but let's see. I'm going to actually make this full screen and maybe, just maybe, nope, everybody is still, oh, hang on one second here. Everyone's still just sleeping. That's okay. Maybe we'll get some activity, but also sleeping kitten, pretty cute. All right. So let's, let's take a couple questions. Okay. Should you be keeping track of how much a kitten eats at each feeding? Well, you know, you can keep track of how much a kitten eats at each feeding. Um, but I think the weight is the most important thing. It's a little bit difficult to keep track of exactly how much a kitten is eating if they're on a bottle or if they're eating out of a dish. Um, it's hard to measure that. Um, if they're eating from a syringe, then definitely it's easier to measure. You can say, oh, they ate three cc's. Um, but if they're eating, you know, from a dish or a bottle, a little harder, which is why weight is a much more accurate uh, way to know how they're doing. Um, if you have a litter of kittens, how can you keep track of who poops? <laughs> well, this is a good, this is a good um, reason to really be um, monitoring our kittens and hanging out with them. You know, sometimes you don't know, sometimes you might see some of it on your kitten. So for instance, um, if you have a kitten who's foot is a little bit wet and you might see that they have some stool on there, then, you know, that's going to be obvious. Um, sometimes it might be less obvious. And, um, in those cases, definitely we want to, um, try to just like visually monitor them. Um, and Hey, some of us have like a little pet cameras at, at home. You could set up, um, a little camera in front of the litter box. You could watch them that way. Um, you can, if you're really concerned, you can of course isolate a kitten out um, and put them with their own litter box and monitor their stool that way. Okay, let's see. How would you approach a veterinarian who does not believe in panleukopenia? I would get a new veterinarian. Honestly, um, panleukopenia exists. And uh, if your vet is not comfortable working with that, then I would try to find a veterinarian who is, is more comfortable with um, feline viruses. Okay, let's see, let's see. We have many kittens that get diarrhea after we treat them with a bunch of dewormers. Um, it lasts for weeks. We've had fecals done and they are negative. What would you recommend? So this is where I was kind of talking about the um, like one, two, three, four, the different things I ask myself when I have kittens who have diarrhea. Definitely, that's really smart that you're doing your dewormers and that's definitely the first thing that I would think. But I think the thing that a lot of people don't think um, and that maybe should become more common line of thought is about the bacterial issues because um, that is only going to show up on a certain type of fecal test. So if they do a gram stain, um, which 
honestly, a lot of veterinarians are not doing. Um, you know, there are different ways that they can see what bacterial content the kitten has. Um, and, and, you know, you want to ask your vet if they are looking at bacteria as well as parasites. Um, but in some cases, uh, you may want to talk to your vet about, um, you know, an, an antibiotic or something to deal with uh, bacteria. But honestly, there's so many different reasons. If it's chronic diarrhea like that, I would be thinking if it's not a parasite, probably bacteria. If it's not bacteria probably a GI nutrition type issue um, if it's chronic. But again, like just find a vet who is really comfortable um, dealing with, with kitten poop. And there's a lot of questions I'm seeing, so I'm just gonna address this as a whole. I see a lot of questions about, is it okay to just give pumpkin to kittens who have um, fecal issues? I really don't like this approach. Um, to me, this is like a very, it's like putting a band-aid on a bullet wound. It doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me. Uh, I see some people say that, oh, if they have problems with their stool, just give them pumpkin. Um, mm, no, if they have problems with their stool, something's going on and pumpkin is not going to solve it. Probably medication is going to solve it. Um, so let's talk to a veterinarian and get a, an actual medication, a prescription for the kitten, um, not just try to give them something that we have uh, in our cabinet at home. Okay, uh, let's see. Is the Pedialyte non-flavored? Yes, please don't give your kittens fruit punch. They will not appreciate that. They don't like that. Give them unflavored uh, electrolyte. Okay, I'm gonna do just a couple more questions here because I've kept you guys long enough, but I could talk to you forever. Um, is it bad if kittens nurse on their blanket or bed? They don't do it to each other, but they do it on one of their beds. That can be common, and if, if it's not hurting them, and it's not hurting the blanket, so I don't mind if a kitten is nursing on a blanket. I think it's kind of sweet. Um, you know, kittens are looking for comfort, and uh, as long as they're not hurting anyone else and not hurting themselves, that's, that's okay. Um, my vet is not accepting new patients. It seems like my five week old kittens might have ear mites. What do I do? So for ear mites, you are going to need a prescription and you're going to need to talk to a vet. So I would check, check out the Royal Canaan, um, ask vet free service. That's still available now through May 31st. Um, I'll send out more information about that in my additional materials. Um, I'll remind you, if you're not registered, go to kittenlady.org slash webinar. Register for this webinar, even after it's passed. If you register it for, it for it today, you will have your email added so I can actually send you these additional materials. But if you look up the Ask Vet service on the Royal Canaan website, um, find a Find a vet there that you can talk to for free um, about whether your kittens need some kind of treatment for their ear mites. Um, okay. And then some people are asking about like dosing information for things. It's not really appropriate for me to tell you about medications and dosing. That's really where you want to talk to a veterinarian. Um, so I will not be able to answer those kinds of questions for you, but uh, talk to a veterinarian about the proper dosing for a kitten. And remember, dosing changes all the time because kittens are growing in weight, aren't they? Um, okay, maybe I'll do one last question. Let's find a good last question. Dun, 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 dun. I'm gonna sound really redundant here, but somebody's asking, um, what's your source for um, ordering uh, injectable fluids for subcutaneous injection? Um, I have butterfly needles, but need bags of fluid. So my answer is my source is my veterinarian and your source will also be your veterinarian. I, I'm sure I sound like a broken record here, but um, you know, as a foster parent, you can, you can administer those fluids if you're trained, but you can't uh, purchase that kind of thing without a veterinarian. Um, so this is why it's so, so important to work with a veterinarian. You know, foster parents plus veterinarians equals foster magic. Uh, so talk to your vet, um, see if they will um, you know, give you some fluids that you can have on hand and you can work with them case by case as needed. Um, so I hope that that answers your question and thank you guys. We'll check in one last time here on chickpea. I'm sure she's still, she's buried herself under her teddy bear. 
Seems about right. <laughs> well, these guys are probably hungry. I'm gonna go check in on them and feed them. Um, spinach is <laughs> looking up and saying, saying hello. Uh, one last little hello before we part ways here. Thank you guys so very much for um, spending all of this time with me. Really greatly appreciate it. And remember that uh, <laughs> that I'll be doing another webinar next week. You can learn more about this webinar series, um, which is a partnership between uh, me, Kitten Lady, and Royal Canaan uh, at kittenlady.org slash webinar. Thank you very much for tuning in, and I am going to go kiss that baby and fix the little gauze on her shoulder because, you know, this is why monitoring is important, and you don't just have to monitor them uh, by watching them on a webcam. <laughs> you can monitor them um, in person. I'm going to go uh, and fix that right now. Maybe make her another little tube sock outfit. Um, but thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I'll see you next week for more. Thank you guys, and bye-bye. <laughs>